seventh and eighth bills pending. I want to thank the committee for its hard work. Uh, this is the most we've done in many, many years. Uh, in fact, the uh, financial bill on the floor, uh, Chairman Crenshaw points out, uh, is the first time we've considered a, that, that bill on the floor uh, since 07. So most of the members of Congress have never seen a financial services bill, Mr. Serrano. Uh, so you're doing great work. I thank you for your dedication and your perseverance and your patience. And today, I would also appreciate your brevity. <laughs> uh, because we will go back in action on the bill on the floor later this afternoon. So I, we, we want to finish this bill as quickly as we can, in all fairness. The uh, 015 Interior Environment Appropriations Bill, being shepherded uh, for the first time, uh, his maiden voyage on this bill, Mr. Calvert, and we're going to ask Mr. Calvert to tell us about his bill. Chairman Calvert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to again uh, thank uh, Chairman Rogers for his support throughout the process this far. Before we get into the details of the bill, I want to take a moment to pay tribute to my good friend, our subcommittee ranking member and subcommittee's former chairman, Jim Moran. Mr. Moran will be leaving Congress at the end of this year after serving his Northern Virginia constituents for 24 years. We all admire Jim for his passion and commitment to the issues he cares deeply about. We don't agree on every issue, but we're good friends and we'll continue to be good friends. Jim, we are all grateful to you for your service and we salute you. That means you have to be nice to me, James. Uh, I want to thank uh, each of our subcommittee members for their active participation in our hearing process this year and the bipartisan spirit that continues to be a hallmark of our subcommittee's deliberations. This fiscal year 2015 Interior and Environment Bill is funded at $30.22 billion, which is $162 million, or one-half percent, above the FY14 enacted level and $409 million, or 1%, below the budget request. The committee has made a sincere effort to prioritize critical needs throughout the bill within its 302B allocation. As you all know, we face some serious challenges. In eight of the last 10 years, the Forest Service and the Department of Interior have exceeded their fire suppression budgets, despite being fully funded at the 10-year suppression average for such costs. Fire seasons have grown longer and more destructive, putting people, communities, and ecosystems at greater risk. Fire borrowing has now become routine rather than extraordinary. This is a major challenge that Congress must soon address. In the meantime, however, the committee has provided robust fire funding in its fiscal 2015 bill. Fire suppression accounts, including the Flame Reserve Fund, are again fully funded at the 10-year average level. The committee has also provided $470 million to address the Forest Service projected shortfall in fire suppression funding for fiscal year 2014. Hazardous fuels funding has increased by $90 million over the fiscal year 2014 enacted level, and the committee has provided the Forest Service funding for two new aircraft to efficiently and effectively uh, uh, fight fires and replace, uh, replace the uh, Korean War era aircraft. The bill also makes critical investments in Indian country a priority shared by the bipartisan members of the subcommittee. Overall, funding for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Education and Indian Health Service is increased by 5% from fiscal year 2014 levels, the largest percentage increase in this bill. The bill also provides for full funding in fiscal year 2015 for the payments in lieu of taxes, or the PILT program. PILT payments are made into uh, 49 of the 50 states, the District of Columbia, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. 
The bill also provides $2.27 billion for the operation of our national parks, including the requested funding related to the centennial of the National Park Service. We've also attempted to address a number of concerns within the Fish and Wildlife Service accounts. The bill funds popular grant programs at fiscal year 2014 enacted levels. It also provides additional funds to, to combat international wildlife trafficking, protects fish hatcheries and cuts and closures, and continues funding for invasive mussels and Asian carp. The bill also provides $152 million for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, LWCF, that enjoy broad bipartisan support. Some members would prefer more funding, others would prefer less funding. We've attempted to forge a middle ground in this, in this bill. Overall, funding for the EPA is reduced by $717 million, or 9% from fiscal year 2014 enacted level. However, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and many geographic programs are funded at fiscal year 2014 enacted levels. Again, this year there's a great deal of concern over the number of regulatory actions being pursued by the EPA in the absence of legislation and without a clear congressional direction. For this reason, the bill includes a number of provisions to address some of these concerns and to stop unnecessary and damaging regulatory overreach by the agency. Before closing, I'd like to make one further point about several Endangered Species Act provisions in this bill. The committee has no interest in letting any species go extinct. What we're concerned about is federal regulatory action based more on arbitrary legal deadlines than on common sense. Nowhere is this more evident than with the sage grouse. States are rightfully concerned that a federal takeover of sage grouse will jeopardize existing conservation partnerships with states and private landowners, which are necessary to save sage grouse. The takeover would eliminate jobs, curtail future job growth, devastate state and local economies, and undermine the nation's ability to develop conventional and renewable resources necessary for energy independence. So long as sage grouse are not under imminent threat of extinction, cooperative conservation must be given a chance to work. This is why this bill includes a one-year delay on any decision to list sage grouse, along with a strong cross-cutting budget, to help implement these collaborative cons uh, conservation plans. In closing, let me thank the staff on both sides for their fine work. It's been an eye-opening experience to see how hard they really do work. This markup is the next step in a long process, and I hope over the coming months we'll come together to find common ground. In that spirit, I look forward to continue to work with Mr. Moran and the members of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moran is recognized. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to miss that uh, phrase uh, when you recognize me, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's, uh, so. Um, uh, start out by uh, thanking all of you and particularly my friend uh, Mr. Calvert. He's, he's been a first-rate chairman. Uh, he has carried out his chairmanship's role in an open and collaborative manner. I've enjoyed working with him as I did with his predecessor Mr. Simpson. Well, thanks. Uh, well, it's true. You know, it's uh, <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, it may not be a bromance, but it's a pretty good friendship, you know? <laughs> the, um, <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, also appropriate to, to uh, recognize uh, the subcommittee staff, uh, Dave, Darren, Jason, Rachel, Colin, and Jackie on the majority side. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, on the uh, Democratic side, uh, uh, Rick and Shalanda have done uh, terrific work, as they always do. Dave and Leslie are invaluable. Uh, David and Leslie, thank you for all that, for all that you do. And, and my personal staff, Tim Aiken. Um, so uh, I think we all know that this couldn't be done. Uh, without uh, superb professional staff. It's been my privilege to serve on this subcommittee, on this appropriations committee, for about 20 years. 
Uh, and while every bill that this committee considers is important, uh, the Interior and Environment Bill can be considered to be vital to the survival of our planet. Literally, the very quality of the air we breathe and the water that we drink depends on the programs that are funded by this bill. Communities depend upon the protection of life and property that this bill provides from the ravages of wildland fires. And the safe and sustainable use of public resources depends upon the programs that are funded in this bill. Millions of Americans make their vacation plans based on their ability to enjoy the natural, scenic, recreational, and cultural resources whose protection and access is funded by this bill. It also provides financial support for millions of Native Americans. Uh, I don't think it can ever be enough, but it certainly uh, has been um, uh, of, of great credit to this subcommittee, what we've done over the last several years. Uh, and it contains a host of fish and wildlife programs that are vital to the survival of numerous plant and animal species. In this bill, we also fund the arts and the humanities, the museums and other cultural institutions that are important to our quality of life. But this bill has suffered deeper cuts over the last decade than any of our other appropriation bills. We've tied ourselves up in a financial straitjacket that doesn't allow us to meet the needs of today, let alone lay a responsible foundation for the future. This indiscriminate cutting has been compounded by those who think more about the next election rather than the next generation, and thus load the bill up with politically inspired legislative riders. We owe it to the generations to come to leave this earth a little cleaner and a little greener than we find it today, but you wouldn't know that by looking at many of the legislative riders attached to this bill. This bill is more than $2 billion less than what was appropriated back in fiscal year 2010. So we're talking about the 2015 appropriations bill, and it's $2 billion less than what was available in 2010. Now, I recognize the difficulties that Chairman Calvert has faced in crafting the bill. While at first glance, the subcommittee's 302B allocation of $30 billion, $220 million appears to be higher than last year, when you factor in increased firefighting costs and the majority's decision to fund the payment in lieu of taxes from discretionary appropriations, we are left with less funds overall than what the subcommittee received last year. As a result, important programs like the Land and Water Conservation Fund are badly underfunded, and many other programs and agencies like the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, and the like are flat funded. The most significant cuts in the bill center on the Environmental Protection Agency. It's time to stop thinking of EPA accounts as a defenseless grab bag for other agencies and programs in this bill. I recognize that with certain members there is a level of frustration with the management of the agency. But I'm deeply concerned that the magnitude of the cuts and the persistent push for more cuts each and every year has now weakened the very foundations of the agency and the important programs that it administers. The bill does include robust funding for wildland fires, including $470 million to pre-fund the expected short shortfall in FY14 fire costs. It's not going to be enough, though. This is a crisis situation, and uh, we're only going to see more and, uh, and, uh, and greater wildfires in the future. Total wild, wildfire costs in the bill now exceed $4 billion. But it's money that has to be spent. Without some relief from these costs, as proposed by our colleague Mike Simpson and endorsed by the administration, fire is going to continue to take a larger and larger share of the interior and environment discretionary budget. You would think when we have an extraordinarily influential member of the Appropriations Committee and the President both wanting something, we could get it done. But no thanks to the, uh, the Budget Committee, we can't seem to do it. That would make an enormous difference uh, in our ability to meet priorities within this Appropriations Bill. Now we've identified 24 problem legislative riders and funding limitations that are contained in the bill. Five new provisions this year. 
These poison pill provisions don't belong in the bill. Their purpose is to undermine important environmental laws, threaten public health and safety, and deny the impact that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions is having on our planet. The legacy we leave to the future should not be one of polluted air and water, extinct species, and exhausted natural resources. This bill was designed to protect nature, but not for nature's sake, for our own sake. Congressman Mo Udall once noted, and here's our quote, uh, my friend, uh, in quotes, the more we exploit nature, the more our options are reduced until we have only one, and that is to fight for survival. We do appreciate the bipartisan support and funding for Native American programs in the bill. To the best of our ability, we are trying to meet our obligations to Native Americans, and I'd like to note the uh, work of our colleagues on the subcommittee especially. Mr. Cole has been uh, terrific. Uh, Mr. Simpson continues to be. Congresswoman McCollum has been terrific on Native American programs. All of the members of the subcommittee uh, have, uh, have spoken up and, and, uh, uh, and really stood out for strong, as strong and consistent advocates for Native American programs. Mr. Chairman, despite the high esteem I have for Chairman Calvert, though, I can't support this bill as currently written. Well, yeah, 24 problem riders, the, you know, which shouldn't be on an appropriations bill, which I know the chairman would be the first to note. Uh, authorization on an appropriation bill? I'm just trying, you know, uh, to keep with regular order. So uh, it, uh, as a result, though, um, we, um, uh, uh, we're going to have some contentious issues today but it's just the first step in a long process towards enactment. I certainly intend to continue working with the chairman and other members to seek improvements to the bill so that in the end, we can have a final legislative product that does have bipartisan support and can be signed by our president. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moran. I want to commend both of you, the chairman and ranking member, for your hard work and dedication to bring this bill out. Uh, this is sort of an alpha and omega day. Uh, alpha, it being the maiden voyage of our new cardinal, our new chairman of this subcommittee. Omega, near omega, for our friend uh, Mr. Moran, who is uh, will be writing a new chapter in his life. We want to wish uh, him a great future. We want to thank you for your passionate commitment, dedication to this committee and to this bill and to the Congress and to your country. And we thank you for your service. We wish you the very best. And for Mr. Calvert, uh, this is, a, uh, I think, a successful maiden voyage. Uh, it's a tough bill to write, a tough bill to handle, a lot of uh, controversial matters in it. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good one under all circumstances. Now, we've passed uh, six bills off the House floor, seven to be, hopefully today or tomorrow. Uh, open rules, regular order. Uh, the first time we've done this type of thing uh, in a long, long time. Uh, I'm proud of all that we've achieved so far. We look forward to getting closer to the goal of passing all 12 bills through this committee before the August break. The Interior and Environment Bill uh, provides just over $30 billion for programs that support our nation's rich natural heritage, energy production, and the well-being of our local communities. Within that total, uh, the bill prioritizes $4.1 billion in critical funding needed to prevent and combat devastating wildlife, uh, wild land fires, uh, improve our suppression tactics, and help fill the expected shortfall in funding for this year. It also increases funding for important programs for our Native Americans, including the Indian Health Service and the Bureau of Indian Services and Education. And it includes $442 million 
for the PILT program, payment in lieu of taxes, providing a one-year extension of this vital program that provides a lifeline to rural communities using discretionary dollars to, find, uh, to fund a mandatory program uh, because the authorizers simply haven't acted. But this bill also makes important steps to free American individuals, families, industries, and businesses from the burdens of the President's overreaching, harmful, regulatory agenda. For the last five years, the administration has been hell-bent on adding layer after layer of regulatory red tape to the economy, limiting development and growth, hampering job creation, ultimately saddling American families with a check. No other agency has done more to inflict this type of pain than the Environmental Protection Agency. From the new Waters of the United States proposal in which the EPA seeks to gain control of most of the country by regulating any land where water could conceivably run to their new standards for greenhouse gas emissions at power plants, which would drive up manufacturing costs, push more hardworking Americans to the unemployment lines, export the jobs overseas, and increase expenses for us consumers here at home. So this legislation includes provisions to stop these onerous regulations, among others, and allow our economy the chance to grow and flourish. The bill also reduces the EPA's budget by $717 million, 9% below last year's enacted level, and cuts back EPA's staffing levels to the lowest level since 1989. This will help the agency streamline its operations and focus its activities on its core duties rather than on expanding its regulatory portfolio. In addition, the bill takes steps to correct the agency's flagrant defiance of this committee. To this end, we've reduced the EPA Office of Congressional Affairs as well as the EPA administrative offices by 50% from last year. Let it be a warning. We will not tolerate agencies withholding from the Congress and the people the accurate, complete information that this committee needs and the Congress needs to do its job. The EPA is not the only agency in this bill that faces reductions to its budget. The bill trims funding wherever possible, targeting lower priority programs for cuts and not including funding for several unnecessary programs such as Fish and Wildlife's Landscape Conservation uh, Cooperatives. I thank the subcommittee for making the tough decisions to ensure this bill stays within its allocations. In closing, let me again thank Chairman Calvert and Ranking Member Moran, all the members of the subcommittee, the staff, that led to the hard work that made this bill possible. This does exactly what an appropriations bill should do. It funds the federal government responsibly, it eliminates the excess, and it exercises the will of the Congress to rein in the administration's unprecedented bureaucratic overreach and help our economy grow. So I urge uh, my colleagues to support the bill. Mrs. Lowy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member Moran, for your work on this bill. Chairman Calvert, congratulations on introducing your first appropriations bill and for following the committee tradition of consulting the minority, even if the outcome is not something we can support at this time. This is the last Interior and Environmental Full Committee markup for Mr. Moran. And as we've said many times, we wish you success in all your future endeavors. We're losing a passionate, hero for the environment, 
And we know that you will keep in touch with us, and we appreciate your many contributions in your extraordinary years of service. Thank you. Again. <laughs> All this attention, my goodness. While I believe we should consider all 12 bills, I am fearful that this may be the last full committee markup of the year. If so, I'd also like to recognize once again my good friends Ed Pastor, who can't be here to stand, and Bill Owens for their service uh, to the committee, and wish them both luck in your future endeavors. That said, Mr. Chairman, I hope we have one more markup to consider the Labor HHS bill and that I have an, another opportunity to say kind words about our departing colleagues. Even though the allocation today is $162 million more than the current level, and it was sufficient to produce a legitimate bill, in my judgment, the majority squandered these additional resources. The dramatic $717 million cut to the Environmental Protection Agency would endanger the health and safety of many communities in the name of protecting the bottom line of industries, many of which already benefit from corporate loopholes that put a heavier burden on middle-class taxpayers. For years, this committee has lamented the growing cost of fighting wildfires that crowd out other priorities. The former chairman of the Interior and Environmental Subcommittee has introduced a bill to remove some emergency wildfire costs from this bill and make them eligible for funding under the disaster budget cap. His bill is bipartisan, is co-sponsored by over 100 members, including many from this committee. Yet wildfire costs in this bill don't have emergency designation, even though they are no less an emergency than hurricanes and tornadoes. I hope that Republicans will join with Democrats and sign a discharge petition to bring the bill to the floor, to designate some of these funds as emergency spending. And this committee should designate, designate them as such in this appropriations bill. The majority also funds the PILT program in this year's bill. For the first time since 2008, these payments in lieu of taxes have been mandatory spending since then to ensure that counties receive 100% of the authorized payment, which they weren't receiving when it was last in our bill. Redesignating PILT as discretionary spending creates another funding shortfall in the bill and compromises our ability to better protect the environment and public health. As a result, acquisition and assistance programs under the Land and Water Conservation Fund are cut by nearly 50 percent, the Heritage Area Partnership Program by nearly 50 percent, which includes the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area in my district, and water infrastructure revolving loan funds by nearly 25 percent. And while the President's request for additional resources for oil and gas inspections is included, it takes the funds from other interior programs instead of making oil and gas companies pay for it out of their billions in profits. In particular, I am strongly opposed to a number of legislative riders, which amount to an industry wish list of giveaways. For instance, there are two special provisions that enable mining companies to avoid cleaning up pollutants, leaving taxpayers on the hook. Once again, ranchers, along with oil and gas companies, get their wish to prevent listing the sage grouse as an endangered species. And in a demonstration of solidarity with climate change deniers and the coal industry, 
the majority prevents the administration from advancing new rules to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Lastly, while I am appreciative the Chairman maintained level funding for important geographic programs like the Long Island Sound, some of the increased resources in this bill should be used to better support these initiatives, which do such important work in so many of our districts. I'd also like to thank the, cha thank the Chairman for $3.5 million for the Highlands Conservation Program and level funding for the Historic Preservation Fund. Both of these programs are important for preserving local landmarks and encouraging tourism in my district. I look forward to improving this bill as it progresses through the Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we invite uh, further general discussion, we've got a uh, birthday boy in our room today. His name is Chris Stewart. He's, uh, the, I think, the newest member of the committee, and he's celebrating his 16th birthday. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> uh, Jamie uh, Herrera Butler is not here yet, uh, but sh uh, when you see her, congratulate her on the uh, one year birthday of her daughter, Abigail. Yes. Today. All right. Is there further discussion, Mr. Chairman, on the bill? Chairman, uh, uh, if, if I may, just take a, a moment here. I want to commend uh, Chairman Colbert, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Moran, good friends. Uh, just to give an idea how important this bill is, I've got some uh, very good friends of ours from Denmark who are here today. The Sorensen family. Just stand up once, okay? Okay. Anyway, they're. Stay, staying with us, and how this is relevant is that this uh, bill funds the very things that have brought them over here. They've been touring the Grand Canyon, uh, Yosemite, uh, Kathy, my wife, is with them today. They're going to be touring uh, here in Washington all the things that you fund in this bill. And uh, it is a huge issue as far as uh, economic development, as far as tourism, and uh, I just want to commend you for your the great job that you've done. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think uh, Mrs. Latham is in the room. Would yes. you stand so we could recognize you? Kathy? <laughs> As there further discussion on the bill, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a subcommittee member, I greatly appreciate the work of Chairman uh, Calvert and Ranking Member uh, Moran as well as all the committee staff who work so hard and so collaboratively. Um, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, you've done a very good job, a commendable job, leading the subcommittee together to put together your first interior bill. And Mr. Moran, as people have said, um, your uh, leadership is going to be missed, but your passion will be missed as well. The Interior Environment Appropriations Bill funds uh, critical work for creating a stronger and more vibrant America. Today, preserving our wild lands, our cultural heritage, our clean air and water for future generations. This bill is about protecting America's national treasures, found in our parks and our forests, and protecting our national resources, including the air we breathe and the water we drink. The investments we make here, in fact, they do create jobs and new opportunities in our communities uh, through cleaning up brownfields and supporting the arts and the humanities. And I'm happy to say that this bill does work to find common ground on many issues, reflecting strong bipartisan support and working relationships that we do strive for in our subcommittee. As a co-chair of the Native American Caucus, along with my friend Tom Cole, and I do mean that sincerely. You do, folks don't hear me say that that often. My good friend Tom Cole, I am pleased with the increased funding in both the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Indian Health Services. This reflects a solid bipartisan commitment to finding a positive solutions for the health and well-being for our Native Americans brothers and sisters. This subcommittee has included enough funding to finish the construction of the three remaining schools on a list developed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 2004. However, 
there are 183 uh, bureau schools, and too many of these schools have crumbling infrastructure and inadequate facilities. The U.S. Congress has a very special obligation to educate Indian children who are the future of America, and substandard schools must not be tolerated as a condition for them to try to learn in. So I do know this is going to continue to be an ongoing um, issue for our subcommittee. The funding for our national park system also remained a priority, and it's very important as our parks prepare for millions of visitors to celebrate their centennial anniversary in 2016. And I want to thank the chairman, who I think can list all the Great Lakes by name by now, for his work in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, as well as his commitment for fighting this threat of invasive species. Where all the members of the subcommittee are in strong agreement is the cost of wildfires. The management of wildfires now composes over 13 percent, 13 percent of this subcommittee's allocation. And we must treat wildfires as the disasters they are. And that's why every member of the Interior Subcommittee is a co-sponsor of Congressman Simpson's bill. And I know we're going to work together to continue to bring that bill to the floor so that we can replace the current broke system, which deals from fire prevention to pay for fire suppression. But there are areas, unfortunately, where this bill falls short. There's an essential responsibility of many agencies within this bill, and that's the stewardship of our environment. The majority has neglected to make the necessary investments in the Environmental Protection Agency to safeguard our air and our water and our land for pollution. Cutting EPA programs puts human health and our communities at risk. Federal funds are essential in maintaining infrastructure that provides our communities with safe water. This bill cuts the Clean Water Drinking uh, State Revolving Fund. Even in my district, the land of 10,000 lakes, my constituents in Minnesota are rightly concerned about the quality and the quantity of safe drinking water. This bill also cuts funding for the cleanup and reuse of contaminated land under the EPA Brownfields Program. The agency estimates there are 450,000 brownfield sites around the United States. Communities that receive brownfield assistance continue to reap benefits to their economy for years to come by putting these polluted lands back into production, creating jobs, and restoring their tax base. But of all the shortcomings in this bill, the one that our children will be most disappointed in is our nation's failure to take a leadership role in addressing climate change. We all know that climate change is real. The science is clear, and we must support federal research and policies to confront this growing crisis. But instead, the majority has chosen to load this bill with writers that undermine the efforts to protect our communities and help our nation adapt. Ultimately, despite areas of cooperation, I am unable to support this bill in its current form. And Mr. Chair, I look forward to the amendment. Proceed. In the interest of time, uh, as you recollect the other day, we uh, instituted a little practice of me tapping the handle uh, at three minutes. It doesn't mean you're through. It just means we hope you are. <laughs> and, Mr. Chair, I had a three-minute speech. You did. It only went five minutes, though. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be quick, too. Uh, I, I have no amendments today, but I rise today to discuss the, uh, the issue of stormwater discharges uh, from the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems Program, or better known as MS4. Uh, last month, over a dozen municipalities in my district received orders uh, from the EPA requiring improvements of their programs uh, for managing stormwater. And after a meeting just yesterday back in my district uh, with the impacted municipalities, uh, I wanted to make you and the rest of the committee aware of the issues facing these uh, small local communities as they, as they try to comply with the EPA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think you would agree uh, that the management uh, of water is best left to decision makers at the state and local level. I do. Uh, and um, it's, it's best when the state of California uh, makes decisions about how to handle its water, and they have, uh, and it's uh, certainly best when Pennsylvanians are able to make decisions about their waters. In this particular instance, uh, many municipalities express frustration uh, with a lack of uh, clear guidance and lack of clarity from the EPA uh, on how each of the, uh, them can fix any alleged deficiencies uh, with MS4 programs 
to come into compliance uh, with the Clean Water Act. Uh, these local legal leaders uh, want to comply, however, they have little guidance on how to make it happen. Uh, this is not the first time that I've uh, brought the issues of confusion uh, surrounding MS4 uh, to the uh, committee's attention. And um, That's right, and uh, this has been an ongoing issue with EPA, as you're aware. We have now discussed for the past three years within this interior bill. This is something we need to resolve. I, th I, th I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And in an ideal world, all types of these decisions would be left up to the state and local authorities. Uh, my local municipal leaders uh, want to serve their communities uh, and believe it is their responsibility to work within the existing regulatory framework. Hopefully, moving forward, uh, we can work to change these, these burdensome rules and regulations. Uh, I would like to ask the subcommittee chairman if he would work with me to address some of the confusion and frustration uh, felt by my local municipalities. Absolutely. Our uh, constituents need clarity rather than confusion. Our communities need results rather than perennial inaction and frustration. Thank you for offering some insight into the experience of your constituents as they try to work with the environmental protection agencies on water permitting issues. Unfortunately, I fear that this is but a representative sample and it's all too common occurrence everywhere. Uh, Mr. Dent, you have always been a tireless advocate for the needs of your district and the state of Pennsylvania. Thank you for bringing this issue to our attention and to the committee, and I certainly look forward to working with you on this issue as we move forward. Uh, thank you for your attention. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady is recognized. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't rise today. First, let me uh, thank the chair of the subcommittee and also our ranking member for uh, their very hard work on this bill. And I, too, want to congratulate and thank Congressman uh, Moran for his oftentimes very bold <laughs> and visionary leadership. But he, he always brings a smile to this body, uh, even though there are very few things oftentimes to smile about. And I'm going to really miss you. Let me um, also thank the majority and the minority for including important language in this bill relating to increasing the diversity in the National Park Service. It's in the manager's amendment, so thank you very much for including this. It's so critical that we devote uh, resources to hiring diverse candidates who re really reflect the population of our country in the National Park Service, as well as supporting efforts to increase visitors from diverse and underserved communities to the national parks. Also, I'd like to express my support for the parks funding. The Park Service desperately needs adequate funding to avoid further reduction in the services that it can provide. We're already seeing the effects of sequester cuts to the national parks through the delayed closure of park roads, closed visitor centers, picnic areas, and campgrounds, and the reduction of at least 1,000 seasonal rangers and 900 permanent staff. I think we all agree that the national parks are really an important part of our country's heritage. We must not risk further cuts to these national treasures. Additionally, I'd like to express my support for the Brownfield Program. The Brownfield Program is a critical investment that has been tremendously effective in cleaning up and reinvesting in properties that are contaminated by hazardous substances and pollutants. This program not only provides public health benefits, it's also an economic driver and a job creator. Every $1 of EPA funding leverages $17.79 of funding from other sources. The Brownsville program also helped create more than 85,000 jobs that bring valuable training and sources of income to our communities. In my district, for example, funding for this program has supported the Cypress Mandela Training Center in Oakland, helping prepare individuals to work on projects that revitalize, beautify, and strengthen the area. Also, experts estimate that as many as one million brownfield properties still remain nationwide. In other words, there are still many more jobs to be created and a lot of work to be done before this mission is complete. So I look forward to working with you on this bill as it moves to the floor and into conference so that this program receives funding for the truly vital work that it is doing. Thank you again. Is there further general discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Chairman, are there amendments? Chairman, I recognize. The clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Calvert. Dispense without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I have a manager's amendment making a number of non-controversial changes to the bill and 
and the report that their interest uh, to the bipartisan members of this committee. Uh, Mr. Moran and I have worked closely in putting this amendment together. We're in agreement. I urge the adoption of the amendment and yield back. Mr. Moran. We are in accord, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pastor. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Calvert and Ranking Member Moran for including lang language that will direct a study by the Park Service on uh, parkways that are measured by the uh, Park Service, so I want to thank them for including it. Mr. Cuellar. Chairman, thank you, and I want to thank you and uh, the ranking member, Ms. Laurie, for the leadership, and I certainly want to thank uh, Chairman Calvert uh, and ranking member Moran for adding um, a language that I had asked to be put back, and that's the $5 million um, to be restored to the U.S.-Mexico Border Water Infrastructure Program. As you know, along the border we have um, communities called colonias. That is, they don't have the basic water, utilities, uh, infrastructure, and, and, and Mr. Cobleson is very familiar because he's been with me and uh, helping provide that funding for colonias. So again, I want to thank you because the people that live in the colonias don't have the basic water infrastructure. When we turn on the water faucet, we take that for granted. They don't have it. So again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member Moran, thank you for restoring back the $5 million uh, for the uh, Colonia program on the border. Thank you so much. Mr. Lloyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank Mr. Chairman uh, for working with me to include my amendment to restore the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Heritage Areas to their FY14 request levels in the Management Amendment. I'm very pleased that the committee will continue its commitment for programs that support economic development, job creation, historic preservation, and cultural enhancement in our local communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll be very brief. I just want to thank uh, Chairman Calvert uh, and Ranking Member Moran for the support of an early, early earthquake uh, warning system uh, for the West Coast of the United States. These are in operation in Mexico and Japan. They can give people either seconds or up to over a minute of warning before an earthquake. Uh, it's a proven technology, and this will help build out the system. And uh, all of us on the West Coast are very grateful uh, to you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Calvert. Uh, thank you very much for your support. Hearing no further discussion, the Chairman is recognized to close. Uh, I uh, believe we have you amended here, Mr. Chairman. I would ask for everyone to support the, uh, support the amendment. Question is on the Calvert. Uh, Manager's amendment, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Chairman Wolf. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment uh, at the I'm desk. Sorry, with the gentleman suspended. One second. Mr. Moran. No, no that's all right. I, I, I'd defer to Frank if he wants to. Uh, uh, go ahead. What? That's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, Frank no, stood you. up. I, no. Uh, gentleman's recognized for an amendment. For a minute? <laughs> for an oh, amendment. for an amendment. Oh. Yeah. Do, do I have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> so we have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read number one. We ask it be considered as without an offer by Ms. Moran. Dispensed with. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this amendment would strike the 24 most egregious legislative riders from this bill. Uh, I know how opposed you are to authorization on an appropriations bill, Mr. Chairman, and you, you might have offered this if we hadn't, but I, we're going to offer it because um, these are egregious. Now, we're under no illusions that sometimes appropriations bills are not wholly free of legislative text. So there is some ample precedent for legislative writers, but this bill goes too far and it includes veto bait provisions that seek to turn back protections for endangered species, limits on greenhouse gas emissions, and clean water protections. We've seen this story before, and you'd think it's time to turn the page. The oil companies, grazers, miners, and other polluters all have their special provisions tucked away in this bill. Most of them we've seen before, but five are new this year. When we start doing the work of the authorizing committees, we not only take on the policy discussions, but the gridlock. Many of us chose to serve on the Appropriations Committee rather than on an authorizing committee 
because we wanted to get things done. We wanted to serve on a committee that puts the public interest over partisan politics. And that's why we ought to stop and return this to an appropriations bill, not a cookie jar of authorizing treats for special interests. Repealing environmental regulations doesn't create jobs or save money. It ultimately costs jobs and costs money. Just ask the residents of the Gulf Coast and other communities that have borne the brunt of environmental disasters. I join with the chairman of this committee in wanting to return what we do to regular order. We can only do that if this committee has the courage to resist external pressure to bring extraneous and highly contentious matters into these funding bills. Our job is hard enough in deciding funding levels for agencies under our jurisdiction. We can't be doing the work of the authorizing committee. So this would be a great time to start a real return to regular order by adopting this amendment, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Kellard. Mr. Chairman, I uh, rise in strong opposition to the gentleman's amendment. President Obama has repeatedly demonstrated to the American people that he has little regard for the legislative process or concern for the economic impacts, Im impact of his regulatory appetite. Just last month, EPA proposed curtailing greenhouse gas emissions on our nation's energy production facilities. This proposal represents the administration's large, or latest attempt to place a stranglehold on our national economy. <coughs> this administration's appetite for new regulations and disregard for the will of Congress has left us with little choice but to block the President's overzealous regulatory agenda in this bill. I believe Congress is the appropriate place to debate any new greenhouse gas requirements and the administration's other regulatory efforts. I'm confident that our entire Republican conference understands both the danger of allowing the President to circumvent conference, uh, Congress and devastating consequences to our economy and job creation if these rules and regulations are approved. The actions we were taken to address the EPA's overreach and to reduce its budget not only help us meet the tight spending constraints under which we're operating, they help our struggling economy and encourage job creators to invest and expand. That's why we have included these provisions in the bill, and that's why the language needs to stay in the bill, Mr. Chairman. I strongly urge a no vote on the amendment to strike the language. Mr. Quigley. I just want to point out something. Um, first of all, let's compare activities. Uh, this Congress uh, and the previous Congress compared to any others in anybody's lifetime here. Uh, if we don't want the President to do anything, let's do something here. Uh, this Congress makes Truman's do-nothing Congress look positively busy. But also, if we compare executive orders, this President is still way behind George W. Bush, way, way behind uh, Bill Clinton, and uh, half as many as President uh, Ronald Reagan, still behind, way behind Jimmy Carter, uh, and still half as many as Richard uh, uh, Nixon. So uh, let's compare facts and figures. Uh, this is a president who's only had to act because we don't. And uh, this is a Congress that has decided the best way to, do, to deal with this is almost a bunker mentality of uh, hoping they can get past four and then eight years of the Obama administration because you don't like his policies. Well, he's a duly elected president of the United States. So if you want to counter something he's done, let's actually pass legislation that has some remote chance of passing both houses uh, and doesn't have uh, baiting writers in this uh, that would guarantee a veto or certainly not bipartisan support. You all know what bipartisan efforts look like. They don't include uh, gotchas. They don't include writers like this that are going to certainly draw opposition. Uh, in the promise to America, both parties include in their language, and I, I've, I've read these recently, that they won't include controversial writers, especially ones that deal with uh, issues that aren't financial, on must-pass financial legislation. That you just pour it on, you, breaking the promise to America. I, I get those issues have to be resolved. They're issues our voters are concerned about. 
But we all know how tough it is to pass these appropriation bills anyway. We know how tough it is to, to get something done. But it, you're making it impossible when you put all these writers on here and then you blame the president uh, because he's trying to do something to deal with the catastrophic issues of our time, like climate change. Uh, but, but you do nothing on a meaningful attempt to, to attempt to pass something on a bipartisan basis except to, in, in biblical numbers, attempt to uh, repeal the health care law. So let's look at the reality of the situation and try to pass meaningful appropriation legislation, and I support this amendment. Further discussion? Mr. Amaday. Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to point out a couple of things because I guess I'm partially at fault. I want to thank the, the uh, chairman for including a couple of these things in here. One is on the sage grouse thing, which uh, we in Nevada refer to as the sage hen. I'd appreciate it if everybody starts saying sage hen instead of sage grouse. Um, but, but, but let me tell you what's unique about this. When you talk about politically Aren't the inspired mayors? writers, and that is hens? the federal government owns 85% of the sage hen habitat in Nevada. And if you do your budget homework, you'll see that in the Department of Interior, whether it's Fish and Wildlife or BLM, in the last 5, 10 years we've been dealing with this issue, the amount of programmatic requests to do regulatory undertakings, like if you're familiar with the issue Fish and Wildlife wants done, in order to protect sage habitat from catastrophic wildland fire and to restore those areas that burn are kind of this. And so at the same time that we're reaching out to states through the Fish and Wildlife Service and saying, what are you going to do? What's the skin you've got in the game? What are you private landowners doing? We ourselves are asking this committee for almost nothing. We've got $15 million in planning money the last few years, nothing on the ground. So when the number one threat is catastrophic wildland fire, nobody's fault, and you ask, for instance, my state director, how's your budget going to change as a result of the sage hen listing? And they said nothing. And when this committee asked, through the chairman, asked the director of the Department of Interior, are you going to have sufficient funds to deal with your responsibility as, and this is an important part, folks, the landowner of this habitat, because it's not birds, it's habitat, and they say, we can't tell you that until we get our plans approved, so we're going to be in here in 2016. You say, well, that's normal, except that the listing decision is going to be made in 2015. So the reason for the one-year delay is not because, God, we hope we come up with a strategy. It's to allow the Department of Interior, through programmatic requests for the next budget cycle, to say, here's what we need to do our part as the landowner of the vast majority of the habitat in the state. So for that reason, thank you, Mr. Chairman, we have asked that this be delayed for a year. I know OMB doesn't like delaying things for a year, but it's like, guess what? If I'm fish and wildlife, and you own most of the habitat that is being threatened, and you tell me that you have asked for and expect to receive no funds to protect that habitat, I'm going to list it. So yes, we want to do everything we can to avoid the listing, treating everybody the same, and when the federal government owns the vast majority of the land, we think it's entirely appropriate that they should therefore ask. It's not the old saw where they asked and we said no, they haven't asked. Ask for the funds to do the right thing in the context of the resource. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Would, would the gentleman yield before he yields back? Just yes. for a question. Uh, uh, we are going to have an amendment on this so we can develop it further. But I have a question. If, if there are only hens, there are no roosters. Isn't the problem going to take care of itself? Well, well actually, to my dis distinguished colleague from uh, the Old Dominion, I want you to know that I also have a gift for you here. It's a, uh, it's, you know, they say, hey, this candy stuff around this committee is getting kind of partisan. I want you to know that I'm here to break the partisan divide. I have in my hand angry birds exploding candy that I'm going to personally <laughs> deliver to you before the next speaker. But it's kind of an easygoing species out there, a little give and take. But as you can see, that is definitely not a hen that is on there. But I will give credit to my colleagues from the Golden State. Uh, between Susanville and Alturas on US 395, they don't have Sage Grouse Summit. They call it Sage Hen Summit. They are also otherwise colloquially known in the West as chickens. So if you pr prefer not to be sexist, you can just call them chickens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Is there further discussion? <laughs> Not, I'm not sure how much that clarifies, but thank you. <laughs> there being no further discussion, Mr. Moran's recognized close. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, we are going to have additional amendments, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Twenty-four poison pill provisions is too much. Some of them are more egregious than others. But the best thing we could do is to simply say this is going to be a real appropriation bill without adding a whole lot of extraneous stuff that ought to be dealt with by the, uh, by the authorizing committees. That's the purpose of this amendment. And uh, uh, I think we ought to have a vote on it because uh, this goes to the essence. If it was not for these legislative riders, this bill could pass and it would be enacted. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, we, uh, we want to raise this amendment. Then we'll, uh, we'll deal with a few of them individually. Uh, but I do ask for support for this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question is on, on the Moran Amendment. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. No. The no's have it. The amendment is not agreed. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll have to have a roll call. A roll call is requested. A sufficient number supporting. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw. Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, no. Mr. Culberson. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Farr. Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah. Mr. Fatah, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen? Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger? Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Hera Butler? Mr. Honda? Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce? Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Ms. Kaptur? Aye. Ms. Kaptur, aye. Mr. Kingston? Mr. Latham? Mr. Latham, no. Ms. Lee? Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Aye. Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran. Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Nunley. Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens, no. Mr. Pastor. Aye. Mr. Pastor, aye. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. No. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Robo Allard. Ms. Robo Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Schiff. Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Ms. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. No. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo. No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vyskoski. Mr. Vyskoski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf. No. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack. No. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Are there members who wish to be recorded? Mr. Chairman, absolutely. Mr. Fatah? I'm not recorded. The gentleman is recorded as a no. I need to change that to aye. Mr. Fatah, aye. Judge Carter? The gentleman is not recorded. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Price? Mr. Chairman, I vote aye. Mr. Price, aye. Okay. Are there other members who wish to vote or change their vote? Hearing none, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 19, the nays are 29. 29. The amendment is not agreed to. Chairman Wolf. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Wolf. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Without objection, the reading is dispensed. Read. What this amendment does is, right now in the law, George Washington's birthday has been moved from his birthday, and most of us celebrate. I think, Mr. Stewart, everyone, we celebrate our birthday on our birthday. It was moved in, I think, 1971 to the, first, to the third Monday in February. So technically, under the law, it, you can never celebrate George Washington's birthday on his birthday because it's between February 15th 
and February 21st. Uh, every Washington scholar, McCullough, and many others have all come out in support of this. Mount Vernon uh, cares very, very deeply about this. Uh, George Washington was a unifying uh, individual. Uh, uh, he treated the Native Americans better than any uh, uh, people during that time. He freed his slaves. We, we know the story of uh, Trenton when they were down to 3,000 people during the, during the eight years of the Revolutionary War. And Washington loved Mount Vernon. Washington only returned to Mount Vernon twice. And he went to Annapolis and, and Mr. Harris's district and gave up his commandership at the end to go back to, uh, to, uh, to Mount, Mount, Mount Vernon. Uh, he's the only president in our history ever elected by a unanimous vote. And, and Abraham Lincoln said on February 22, 1842, Washington's birthday, President Lincoln said the following, this is the 110th anniversary of the birthday of Washington. We are met to celebrate this day. Washington is the mightiest name on earth, long since mightiest in the cause of civil liberty, still mightiest in moral reformation. On that name, Lincoln said, a eulogy is expected. It cannot be to add brightness to the sun or glory to the name of Washington is impossible. Let none attempt it, he said, in solemn awe pronounce the name, and in its naked, deathless splendor, leave it shining on. This amendment would return George Washington's birthday to his actual birthday, February 22nd. Secondly, I'll tell you, Mount Vernon takes no federal funds. You've been down to Mount Vernon, uh, the, the foundation out in Nevada, the Reynolds Foundation has been very, very supportive, the Fred Smith people, they take no federal money. And so they would like to have his birthday back, whereby they could celebrate George Washington's birthday on February 22nd. Well, the chairman, you. Well, the chairman, you. Gentlemen, I want to congratulate Chairman Wolf. Uh, all of us, most of us, I think, remember younger days when the George Washington celebration was on February 22nd, regardless of what day of the week it was. Uh, and we did that for so many, many years because of what. Uh, the chairman has just quoted Abraham Lincoln from saying, Washington is the president. He's the one that set the pattern. He's the one that uh, stood tall uh, and fought as a soldier. And then having had the chance to declare himself king, retired back to his home, setting the pattern for all time. Uh, this first of all presidents, first in the hearts of his countrymen as well, deserves that day to himself. When today's young people read we're going to have President's Day, they think it's in celebration of the fact that we've got a president, not the fact that we've, we're talking about the president that set the pattern for all others. So I think it's a, a great, worthy amendment, and I uh, urge you to support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Fattah. George Washington, after the British had got a hold of the city, I took his uh, troops up to Valley Forge. I take my children there and study the, uh, the effort after losing the battle at Brandywine. Uh, this was a, just an extraordinary effort. And I want to join with the chairman, uh, with, uh, Frank Wolf, in support of this amendment. Because I think that a birthday is a birthday. And I think that when we don't look at the individual achievement of George Washington, I think collectively the country loses something uh, by um, this congregation of uh, uh, President's uh, Days. So, you know, I'm in support of this, and I hope that uh, my colleagues would support it. Chairman Calvert. Uh, I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. Uh, as noted by other members of the committee, George Washington is certainly a monumental figure, maybe uh, our number one monumental figure in our country's history. It's worth noting, by the way, that current law does not recognize President's Day now. So this would not add another federal holiday. It simply would have Washington's birthday celebrated on February 22nd, the actual date of the birth, instead of a third Monday in February as it is now. So I, uh, I appreciate the intent of the gentleman's amendment. I believe it would generate the support of a bipartisan cross-section of members of Congress. 
Uh, would the Chairman Wolf yield for a question? Yes, sir. Uh, a point of information. Uh, we, we have what's now called President's Day, which is always on that Monday. What happens to that? Pre under the law, it's George Washington's birthday. And in 1971, they moved a number of, birthday, a number of holidays to the Monday. In other words, Veterans Day, and then they moved it back. So there, the, all this, this costs no money. All it does, and President's Day has developed almost by discount shoppers and mattress days. And you may see, you may see the advertisement on the local station where one local store advertises a furniture with George Washington doing the twist. So there's no chance. We just move it back from that Monday back to uh, his real birth, birthday. Mr. Moran. But I'm not sure what happens to President's Day. Is that just gone now? I mean, what happens to Abraham Lincoln now that the chairman raised the issue? Abraham Lincoln was never celebrated. There, there's the President's Day just kind of came yeah. as sort of os, 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 osmosis. Uh, George War, uh, Lincoln's birthday is celebrated in Illinois. It's celebrated in my former state, I believe, in Pennsylvania. It's celebrated in California. It's celebrated, I think, in Wisconsin. It's celebrated in Kentucky, his and, birthplace. And in Kentucky, his birthday. But that's a separate issue. This, moves, this takes the current law that says it's Washington's birthday that moved it to that Monday back to his real birth birthday. Well, but and President's Day remains, I gather. I, I, I was just curious, that you, but we're not going to oppose the, your bill. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, George uh, Mount Vernon is in my district, as the gentleman knows, and we urge everyone to visit it. It's a terrific experience. Uh, and, um, and I thank the, ge the gentleman from taking the initiative. So we're good with it. Ms. Wasman Schultz. Thank you. Um, just to continue the, uh, the, the picky line of questioning. Um, so at one point, Washington's birthday and the, holiday, the federal holiday we celebrated was only celebrating Washington's birthday. And then eventually it, was, it evolved and it changed to be President's Day because we also included Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And that was celebrated on Monday. I, and I presume it was moved to Monday uh, not to make it easier so that folks could have a three-day weekend, but because both of their birthdays were on different days. And so settling uh, on the Monday after a weekend, which is a typical day that we celebrate federal holidays, um, satisfied the celebration and acknowledgement of both uh, presidents, both significant presidents' birthdays. So, um, not to get too far in the weeds on this, but I understand what the significance, uh, as someone who happens to love my own birthday, uh, still, um, I, I get wanting to celebrate someone's birthday on the actual day. But I don't think it's clear now what would happen to the acknowledgement and celebration and recognition in, a fed, in the form of a federal holiday with Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And would we have two, um, or would we simply now have a federal holiday on February 22nd? Lincoln's birthday is February 12th, and it is celebrated in many parts of, of the nation. O OPM does not recognize that. OPM only recognizes George Washington's birthday. That's the law, and it's celebrated on that third Monday. And in answer, more directly, David McCullough wrote a letter. He said, the place of George Washington in American story, his all-important example of courage and integrity and leadership, can hardly be overrated and must never be taken lightly. Nor should we celebrate his birthday on any other day but well, February 22nd. And so it, it doesn't impact time. OPM, doesn't. Yeah. No, I mean reclaiming my time. I, I, I'm not quibbling or arguing that we shouldn't significantly and specifically honor George Washington on the date of his birthday. But cele local celebrations around the country acknowledging Abraham Lincoln's birthday is, uh, is, is probably deficient for many uh, because we, we have evolved in the law or not to President's Day, which is honored, uh, honoring both presidents' uh, birthdays. And both presidents are significant. And I would not like to see us move away from affirmatively acknowledging Abraham Lincoln's birthday in the form of a federal holiday. So if that's what you're doing, then that is concerning to me. It's not a federal holiday. Is that what it's, you're doing? It's, it's not a federal hol holiday. It, it is under the law. It is George Washington's birthday celebrated on 
that third Monday. It is not a so federal we holiday. have simply evolved to calling it President's Correct. Day? Correct. And in, and in the process, you're also celebrating President Buchanan, who was one of the worst presidents of the United States. <laughs> you won't get any argument there. <laughs> there being no further discussion, Chairman Wolf's recognized close. Uh, I would urge, uh, you know, a yes vote. I don't think I really have to say very, very more. When you look at David McCullough, what he said, and all the Washington scholars, and on behalf of Mount Vernon, who takes no federal funding, and they, they, they would like to, whereby he is a unifying figure for this nation. And I ask for an aye vote, and I thank the gentleman, and thank the chair. The question is on the Wolf Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Moran. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, identified as number two. Clerk will read. I'm going to offer by Ms. Moran, page 129, beginning on line 20, strike section 435. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, you want to tell me I'm recognized for five minutes? Please? Someone's recognized for five minutes. They, they, uh, uh, this amendment would strike section 435 of this bill uh, because it prohibits funding for any regulation or guidance establishing a performance standard for major new or existing sources of greenhouse gas emissions. As Daniel Patrick Moynihan liked to say, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not their own facts. And this applies to the reality of global warming. 97% of all climate experts agree that human activity, specifically the combustion of fossil fuels and the release of carbon into the atmosphere, is changing our climate, and we're seeing the consequences all around us. We, look, I mean, we need look no further than the severe drought conditions in the south and west and the growing cost of combating wildland fires. This committee's bill should not be the legislative means to block the administration's attempt to do something about this. This chamber has had multiple opportunities to respond to the threat of climate change. But the House majority's response is to figuratively put its head in the sand and pretend that nothing is happening. The President, however, has taken the more responsible course and used the authority granted him under existing law to curb greenhouse gas emissions. The proposed regulation dealing with existing power plants relies heavily on the existing State and Federal Clean Air Act partnership, which enables states to develop their own path to reduce carbon emissions. States will have the flexibility to cut emissions based upon what makes the most sense for their unique situation which can include options like reducing demand through efficiency improvements, encourage produ encouraging production of cleaner sources of electricity, cap and trade programs, and a menu of other mitigating measures. States can even work collectively with other states to develop multi-state carbon reduction plans. Mr. Chairman, the EPA rules should have resulted in a collective sigh of relief from power plant operators. Not only do they allow each state some flexibility, but the rule would require a 30 percent reduction by 2030 compared with 2005 levels. By using 2005 as a baseline, EPA has already given credit to reductions taken since then. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that these standards are part of a larger effort taken by the administration to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In 2012, the American automobile sector agreed to fuel efficiency standards for cars and light trucks that will cut 590 million metric tons between, to, between 2012 and 2025. Those standards will do as much, if not more, to curb emissions as the power plant rules that we're discussing today. The major difference is that the automobile industry decided to get on board, and the fossil fuel industry, though, has decided to dig in and fight any environmental progress. The 1990s critics of EPA's efforts to stop acid rain made some of the same claims about electricity prices increasing and the lack of available technologies. These predictions were wrong then, and these and, and uh, the predictions that we have today by the same folk are wrong as well. I ask for your support to remove this short-sighted policy rider from the bill. We vote for this amendment and we can stand up for generations to come by admitting that climate change is real and that it's time to do something about it now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman uh, Calvert. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, rise to oppose this amendment. Last month, under orders from President Obama, EPA released a proposal to regulate emissions from existing power plants. This allows an earlier proposal from EPA to regulate emissions from future power plants. President Obama is using the EPA as a tool to unilaterally bypass the Congress and the American people. He's using EPA to drive the energy sector away from coal and toward preferred energy sources. Meanwhile, Congress has acted consistently and decisively to reject cap-and-trade proposals. And to say this isn't going to be a cost, I can say to my own state of California, where we have a number of Democratic legislatures who just uh, uh, wrote a bill to uh, limit cap-and-trade in the state of California, because the estimate is it's going to raise, already we have the highest gas prices in the United States. The estimate is, once this is implemented, it will raise gas prices by another 15 cents a gallon in the state of California. Already a very expensive state to do business with. Uh, further, the Supreme Court recently ruled that EPA does not have the authority to rewrite the Clean Air Act as it has been attempting to do, to do in order to make a square peg fit in a round hole because the Clean Air Act was never intended to address carbon dioxide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes himself. The President's new proposed regulations on power plants more in a steady stream of edicts that will result in rising energy costs, less energy security, and opening up a new front in the war on coal. Mining permits in Kentucky have ground to a halt. Oil and gas leasing on federal lands and our outer continental shelf are stagnant. Onerous regulations are shuttering power plants. And EPA officials have gone on the record expressing a desire to, quote, crucify, quote, the fossil energy industries, which have been the backbone of our energy security for decades. While we hear the president pay lip service to creating more jobs and ramping up our economy, policies like these are driving people in my region to the unemployment line in droves. 8,000 miners in eastern Kentucky alone have lost their jobs since the President took office. Additionally, such regulations have forced the closure of a power plant in my district because it would cost nearly a billion dollars to comply. And that power plant is in within sight of the coal mines that serve it. This resulted in 1,200 lost jobs and likely rate increases for the consumers who will be getting their power from further away and on a stressed grid. With this rule, EPA says it's trying to clamp down on carbon emissions from our power plants within the U.S. Yet they have no ability to regulate the carbon emissions from for other countries, which make up 80 percent of the world's to uh, total output. The EPA would get, have us believe that if we give up low-cost sources of electricity, give up the good-paying jobs that go along with producing that energy, and give up a major cost incentive for manufacturers to produce here in the U.S., that somehow the world will be a better place. Meanwhile, China shows no inclination to slow their economy as they release a quarter of the world's CO2. The EPA has presented us with a false choice in a zero-sum game. Either we bring our economy to a halt in an effort to reduce carbon emissions by the smallest of amounts, or risk the health and safety of the planet. This doomsday talk grows tiresome, as forecast after forecast has proven wrong. In order to achieve energy and economic security, we must balance our reliance on both conventional fuels, coal, natural gas, oil, nuclear, and investments into renewable energies to power our future. These new rules are simply more attempts to legislate through regulation. The results will be spiking energy costs, greater reliance on foreign sources of energy, and lost jobs. As a result, I must urge you to vote no on this amendment. Mr. Farr. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't going to rise on this until I've heard a couple of comments, particularly about California. You know, we're all struggling with this issue of global warming and clean air and clean water. Congress took magnificent approaches uh, in developing clean air legislation, because it's the first time that we set national policy saying that the air shall be clean. And we gave a lot of authorities to EPA to determine the micro regulations. In fact, there's a provision in law, in law, that says if California adopts clean air standards, you can use the California standards, it's, it's that in law, to apply to other states. And California did that with a very famous bill that was assigned by uh, Governor Schwarzenegger when he was uh, governor. Everybody opposed it on the industry side, all the automobile manufacturers, all the power plant manufacturers, and we've been implementing that law. And it called for, in one part, that uh, for, to reduce emissions, that 30 percent of the entire energy of California had to be uh, produced by alternative energies, non-carbon based energies, by 2020. 2020 is the goal line for meeting that 30 percent. We're already there. We're already there. And it's, what it's doing, it's changing people's behaviors because they're getting into these alternative energies, solar being the biggest one, where one-third of Southern California houses have put <laughs> solar panels on them, and they're off the grid. They're generating the only electricity. The, the company has kind of got excess electrons because the people aren't in demand. This is, this is a big industry. It's providing a lot of jobs. And, and to think that if we just stick to this old smokestack industry, that we're going to be in better economic situation. Mr. Chairman, you quoted China. China's got a huge air problem. They know that. And, and most people who visit China will tell you that what they're doing to, to clean it up uh, is far greater than the standards we're using in the United States. And, you know, in the future, companies in, in, are going to attract businesses that are going to grow in places where it's healthy, healthy living, where the air quality, water quality, and the quality of the community, the quality of the state, it's not just going to be whether it's taxes and regulation. It's going to be, do people want to live here? In California, we've done a lot of that. We do, we, I mean, our regulations are a lot stronger than the federal government. This bill, and, and the way you've written it, I'm surprised being a Californian because you hurt the California. Uh, it'd be better to have an equal playing field where the rest of the country moved up these standards. Why? Because we're going to have a healthier climate and healthier. And as far as the price of gasoline, yeah, California has the highest gasoline, not because it costs at the pump, it's because the taxes we put on it. We buy more gasoline than anybody in the country, so we, ought, we and that price is the cheapest, but we have the highest taxes. So I think that this amendment is essential if you want to have a future healthy economy, as the chair talks about. Let's encourage economic security through leadership, not through chicken. <laughs> Mr. Spingray. <clears throat> okay. I wasn't going to bring up chicken, but. Um, so I just want to rise in support of this amendment to st uh, strike Section 435, and I appreciate Mr. Moran for sponsoring the amendment, Mr. Farr for supporting it, and I don't need to say a lot more things, but I represent a rural state, as many of you do, and it's hard to go back to your district and not find constant examples from our constituents who feel that the effects of climate change are real, and they're constantly asking me, what are you guys down in Washington doing about it? I have a lot of farmers who are confused by changing growing seasons and temperatures, rainfall amounts, less predictable yields, finding it difficult to plan what they're going to be doing in the future. We have a lot of foresters and forestry products in our state, more invasive species, and increasing fears of wildfire, which I know so many of you are dealing with in a much more serious way. Most importantly, I represent a lot of fishermen. They're worried about ocean acidification and the effects of climate change, movement of the species to colder water. This is the livelihood of so many people in my district. It's related to our tourist industry. It's part of the huge culture of our state. They ask me all the time, what are you people in Washington going to do about this? And we just can't stand back and say, well, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to see if it gets worse and watch how fast that happens. The committee bill is one of the places where we can do something about this issue. It shouldn't be used as a place to block the administration's attempts to do something about it, which is 
um, one of the few things we're actively doing right now to fix this serious problem. This spring, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere climbed to past 400 parts per million. It's getting very serious. We should be looking for solutions right now, not blocking them. So I urge my colleagues to support the Miranda Amendment, and thank you for doing Chairman it. Chairman Wolf. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I recognize the chairman of, of the committee, Mr. Calvert. I, I just want to read a quote, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, from a state assemblyman in the state of California, Henry D. T. Perea, uh, Democrat, Fresno, California. I quote him, the cap and trade system should not be used to raise billions of dollars in new state funds at the expense of consumers who are struggling to get back on their feet after the recession. In some areas of the state, like the Central Valley, constituents need to drive long distances and they will be disproportionately impacted by, raising, uh, by rising gas prices. I want to point out that the money that's being raised under this cap and trade scenario in the state of California is being used to fund a high-speed rail here in, the state, in, our, in our state of California. So it's basically a tax, Mr. Chairman, on the consumers uh, in the state of California and I don't think it's the right thing to do, and I certainly oppose this amendment. Thank you. Ms. Westman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I rise in support of the amendment. Um, I, I want to speak a bit more broadly about the impact uh, that we're ignoring when it comes to the impact of carbon and the impact that it's had on global warming and climate change. Uh, it is pretty disappointing that this is likely uh, to be the last bill that we mark up in this committee this year. And um, unfortunately, our, our last hurrah has ended up being an ideological dumping ground of short-sighted environmental policies. And there's just no place for policy writers like this one. Uh, what I'm particularly concerned about is the approach taken by some colleagues that <laughs> is nothing short of a departure from the Federalist principles uh, embedded in our Constitution, which so many of you talk about your reverence for. To hear some talk, I, I get the impression that you'd prefer the old Articles of Confederation, where in large part it was every state, or sometimes every person for that matter, who would focus on themselves and what their needs were to tap our natural resources. Uh, what our founding fathers learned then and is still true today is that without a level playing field between and within the states and flexible but fair rules that apply to everyone so that no one takes more than their fair share or spoils a resource for everyone else, that you end up with a tragedy of the commons. Uh, and make no mistake, the, the Republican approach to management of our natural resources, our national natural resources, especially our ocean and coastal ecosystems, which are dramatically impacted by global warming and climate change, will take us back down that painful road. For example, there's a bill, uh, th th this bill includes a policy rider uh, beyond this one that blocks the administration's national ocean policy. Uh, representing a district that is slowly being swallowed by the ocean with nine inches of sea level rise uh, since the 1930s. And as much as in, uh, in, uh, in a publication that, uh, that had an article out today, as much of a 30 centimeter rise could make parts of our coastline uninhabitable, we absolutely must deal with the impact of carbon. And so uh, sticking our heads in the sand is, uh, is not going to solve that problem. Working together is. And I would hope that we could return to the spirit of uh, bipartisan cooperation that this committee traditionally uh, enjoyed. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to be on this committee, uh, as we have all, many of us have referred to our desire to serve on appropriations rather than on a, uh, a specific policy-oriented committee. Um, but it, it's, it's ignorant and, uh, and callous indifference that we will pay consequences for dearly uh, down the road. Uh, and it will be sooner rather than later. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. diaz Billard. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I actually have a question. If this amendment were to pass, specifically, how many degrees would uh, the planet cool and when? Anyone? Anyone? I mean, we know, Mr. I, I, while we get that answer, Mr. Chairman, we know the negative effects on the economy. We know the, ne ne the uh, increase in employment. But What's, what's it going to do? How many degrees and by when will this, if this amendment passes, will the planet cool? It, uh, how many degrees, how many degrees, this is supposed to be for global warming. How many degrees will it cool? Mr. Chairman, I'll await that answer. Thank you, sir. I'll yield back. 
There being no further discussion, Mr. Moran's recognized close. Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a uh, very serious situation that confronts this country. But <clears throat> it's not affecting our lives anywhere near as much as it go is going to affect the lives, particularly the quality of the lives of our children and grandchildren. We know what is happening across the globe. Now, we're interdependent, and what we do is not necessarily uh, going to influence other countries. Uh, and the air that we affect, of course, is not contained over the continental United States. But I think we do recognize that if we don't show leadership, we can't expect the rest of the world to follow us. Mr. Chairman, this is reasonable. It, it gives credit to individual states. For the last 10 years, it encourages states to work on their own. California is going to meet the standard. That's not the concern. Uh, the health and welfare of our children and grandchildren is the reason why this amendment uh, should be passed, so that we don't pre prohibit the Environmental Protection Agency from carrying out uh, the law that was written a generation ago with the Clean Air Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question is on the Moran Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed will say no. No. The no's have it. The amendment is we'll have to ask for roll call vote, Mr. Chairman. Roll call is requested. A sufficient number supporting. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw? No. Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Cuellar? No. Mr. Cuellar, no. Mr. Culberson? No. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro? Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent? No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Blart. Mr. diaz Blart, no. Mr. Farr? Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah? <coughs> Mr. Fleischman? Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Freelingheisen? Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Hero Butler. Ms. Hero Butler, no. Mr. Honda. Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Aye. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kingston. Mr. Latham. Mr. Latham, no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran. Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Nunnally. Mr. Owens, aye. Mr. Owens, aye. Mr. Pastor, Ms. Ms. Pingree, aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney, no. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roba Allard, aye. Mr. Roba Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo? No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vesklowski? Aye. Mr. Vesklowski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf? No. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack? No. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder? <coughs> Mr. Yoder, no. Are there members who wish to be recorded? Mr. Fleischman? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to be recorded as no. Mr. Fleischman, no. Are there further members who wish to be recorded or to change their vote? Hearing none, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 18, the nays are 29. <coughs> the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Gentlemen from Georgia. I have an amendment at the desk. And Clerk will read. offered by Mr. Graves. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment that I, I bring today that uh, first uh, I want to thank uh, Representative Blackburn uh, from Tennessee who brought it to our attention in, in, while working with uh, Chairman Upton as it relates to a new um, reporting in the Federal Register that occurred on July 2nd. 
here just recently, just a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and it relates to the EPA and uh, a new rule that they're, they're attempting to implement called the Administrative Wage Garnishment. And I want to read to you the summary out of the Federal Register and what it says in verbatim. It says, the direct final rule will allow EPA to garnish non-federal wages to collect delinquent non-tax debts owed to the United States, and this is the key point, without obtaining a court order. Now, this rule will take place, uh, will take effect on September 2nd, uh, not too many weeks away. And this is a, a, a rule that really is not even subject to review whatsoever. And the reasoning from the EPA is this, and they say not a, this does not, because it does not have a significant regulatory action. And I think we in this committee should be shocked that the EPA would attempt to reach so far into the wallets of our, of our uh, constituents and, and do such in such a fashion in which there is no judicial review whatsoever, there's no account, there's no proceedings. It's just <coughs> if they deem that you owe dollars, uh, they have the ability to now garnish your wages. Uh, so this amendment is very simple. It just uh, basically says none of the funds made available by this act shall be used to implement this rule that would take effect on, uh, that was in the Federal Register on July 2nd. So uh, I would uh, ask the committee uh, to, uh, to support this amendment and protect your constituents from the EPA. Chairman Calvert. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this amendment. On July 2nd, as the gentleman mentioned, EPA issued a direct final rule that would allow the agency to administratively garnish wages in order to collect debts owed. EPA's rule would allow the agency to collect up to 15 percent of an individual's income when Americans are already struggling to make ends meet. E EPA would be able to garnish wages without a court order, giving an agency with a track record of mismanagement entirely too much power to act unilaterally. This rule is just the latest example of an agency that is so out of touch that it thinks it can just simply propose final rules without any, taking any sort of comments whatsoever. I hope they're, they're watching so the, they can log on this, on this committee's comment to stand down on this type of rulemaking. I urge the adoption of the amendment from Mr. Graves. Mr. Moran. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I rise to offer a different perspective uh, than the one offered by the gentleman from Georgia. EPA has issued a rule to garnish wages from those that haven't paid their debts owed to the federal government. All agencies are allowed by law to establish debt collection regulations to recoup debt. Rather than pile on to EPA, if, if the gentleman has an issue with the government collecting debt, then we ought to deal with it government-wide. There are 30 other agencies that do this. They've implemented wage garnishment as a way to collect debts owed them. Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Treasury, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Commerce, G GSA, Ag, Social Security Administration, Department of Material, they all do this. Now, I'd be on the gentleman's side if he found that EPA was using dilatory tactics to collect these late debts, uh, but they do have a responsibility to collect them in an honest and trustworthy manner. But the offer of the amendment doesn't seem to have an issue with the way EPA is collecting debt because the EPA hasn't issued its final regulations for collecting the debt. So it hasn't even done it. It hasn't done anything differently than any other agency except not doing what other agencies are now doing. So to put this in perspective, EPA has valued the outstanding debt at $228,000 from 14 people. Most of the debtors are former employees who no longer work for the federal, for the federal government. Or they're contractors, or there's a few participating in various programs like Superfund, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. 14 people, 228,000. EPA suggests they would do what 30 other agencies are already doing. There's no complaint with the way they're doing it because they're not doing it yet. Why can't they do what 30 other agencies are doing? You know, it strikes me that this is another one of those talking point memos. When you get down into the guts of what it's all about, it's a little silly, frankly. Uh, sure, I'd be more than happy to yield to my friend. As you know, yeah. the agency, the EPA, yeah. went right to the rule. They didn't ask for public comment. That's, by the way, the other agencies that you mentioned 
virtually all of them ask for public comment prior to directing the rule. Why would EPA do that? Well, probably because they want to go ahead and get collect these debts. There's 14 people. They want to do it as efficiently as possible. They know that the majority is always complaining about the long procedural regulatory process. Let's just get it done, collect the debt, do it the way 30 other agencies are doing it. I don't know why they, you know, they haven't gone through. Uh, uh, hmm? What's the answer? <laughs> I don't know, but it, uh, it doesn't seem to me this is worthy of our time, frankly. There being no further discussion, Mr. Graves is recognized to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I thank Chairman Calvert for his, his support of this. And um, This isn't so much about how, how they collect. It's about trampling the rights of, of Americans here. And so maybe today it is only about 14 individuals, and I'm glad you know who they are because I don't know who they are. And uh, the EPA apparently has, has decided that they can go around the process, they can do a direct final rule for whatever reason they choose, maybe because it's just inconvenient, maybe it's inconvenient for them right now uh, to, to go the right way and to have actually a, a process in which the American people can have input and that there can be objections raised if they choose. Now, let's suppose they, um, they do choose to garnish someone's wages. What, what is their course of action from there? Nothing. There is no court order. It would seem to me that this committee and everyone else and, and, uh, would, would support the fact that shouldn't somebody, at least shouldn't this federal government, with the power it has, have the ability to... Would the gentleman yield? The, the gentleman court, is recognized to close this, but, only. Uh, and he has closed. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, the question I ask is on the consent. Graves Amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed will say no. 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 The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments? Ms. Kaptur. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and, mem and members, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. Kaptur on page 32 in the committee report before the paragraph relating to bill language. Insert the following. America's I first frontier. Without objection, the reading is dispensed. That the amendment be considered as read. My colleagues, I'm offering this amendment within existing funds, urging the Department of Interior to streamline, better organize, and improve uh, its interpretation uh, for modern understanding of a critical breakpoint in America's history the westward expansion and settlement of America's first frontier, the Northwest Territory. The America we know today would not have been possible without this transformational step-off to westward expansion that began with the Northwest Ordinance being signed in 1787 and then confirmed by Congress in 1789. Throughout the states that once made up the Northwest Territory, my own of Ohio, and adjoining states, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and parts of Minnesota, the entire Great Lakes region, public lands are already available and enjoyed by visitors for their natural beauty, environmental benefits, and frankly, a commercial advantage. Just in Ohio, in 2012, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, which is close to the original U.S. western border where Pennsylvania joins Ohio, was the 10th most visited national park. Visitors to the region spent an estimated $137 million with the park supporting over 2,000 jobs in the region. Nearby, Perry's Victory and International Peace Memorial Park on Putin Bay has close to 150,000 visitors who spent $11.5 million, uh, $11 million in the area and hundreds of jobs tied to that park, uh, many more than most small businesses. Other state and federal holdings throughout the Great Lakes hold pieces of this extraordinary <clears throat> legacy story of America's growth. But even today, we are missing a critical opportunity that the Department of Interior can help with to engage visitors and to provide the historical context of this region's importance to the American narrative. Let me give you an example. If you go to the Native American Museum, you will see many of the doc copies of many of the documents that I referenced in my remarks. But believe me, those are not shared regionally, even electronically, across uh, the region. Um, I realize that the Department of Interior spends most of its funds outside the capital area, west of the Mississippi River, but I am speaking up for the Great Lakes with this effort, 
and um, we really have an opportunity to tell the full story of American of the American narrative and the growth of this great country. Well, the lady, I would be pleased to yield. I'd be more than happy to accept your amendment. I thank the gentleman for accepting the amendment. I Question. thank you on behalf of the Great Lakes. Question is on the chapter amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The amendment is agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Robert Allard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk and ask that the reading be Clerk and offered by Ms. Robo Allard. Uh, my amendment uh, strikes. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, my amendment uh, strikes the rider prohibiting the use of funds to implement EPA's 2008 lead renovation, repair, and painting rule. The RRP rule is a critical public health intervention that protects the public from the hazards of lead based paint associated with renovation, repair, and painting activities. Millions of homes in the United States still contain hazardous amounts of lead. When layers of old paint are improperly removed or disturbed by renovations, they can poison workers and especially children. In fact, each year in the United States, 310,000 one to five-year-olds are found to have unsafe levels of lead in their blood. This lead poisoning can result in learning disabilities, brain damage, behavioral problems, and a wide range of symptoms from headaches and stomach pains to anemia. Exposure to lead by workers can damage the central nervous system, cardiovascular system, reproductive system, hematological system, and the kidney. Also of great concern is that the families of construction workers can be exposed to lead brought home from the workplace, for example, on their clothes. The good news is that this lead poisoning is entirely preventable by proper handling and preventing children from coming into contact with lead in the first place. This is the entire rationale behind the lead RRP rule. The rule simply requires renovation, repair, and painting firms to be EPA certified and for workers to be trained and certified in the use of lead safe work practices. This rule is strongly supported by the entire public health community and preventing its implementation primarily to force EPA to recognize a commercially available lead test is unconscionable. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Chairman Calvert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I regret that I must oppose uh, my good friend from California's amendment. When EPA first issued the lead certification rule for contractors back in 2008, the rule offered an exemption from training for those uh, contractors who use an EPA approved kit to determine that no paint existed at the renovation site. <coughs> Today, six years later, we yet to have a kit, therefore placing a, a de facto moratorium on the exemption. So it's clear the EPA never intended to allow contractors to opt out of tra training via that exemption. You know, I point out that uh, somebody the other day, we, we won World War II in four years, and EPA can't come up with a test kit in six years. So I would tell them to get the lead out, and let's get this, <laughs> let's get this test kit completed. Uh, nonetheless, the language in the bill exempts EPA, uh, prompts EPA to finish what it's intended to do, approve a lead test kit as an alternative to a costly third-party lab testing so as to prevent delays and reduce the cost in home renovations. It's simple, straightforward, common sense language where EPA's 2008 rule is anything but that. EPA's lead and renovation rule sets onerous standards for test kits that remain commercially unavailable. And it's yet another example of EPA's finalizing a rule without unattainable standards. I might point out to folks in the audience that EPA's proposed standards for new power plants, which assume carbon capture and storage technologies that are not commercially available or scalable. EPA's proposed guidelines for existing power plants, which cannot be met through technological operating improvements at affected facilities. Or EPA's ballast water rule, which assumes compliance using Coast Guard certified technologies that don't even exist. <laughs> so it goes on and on. I, I urge a, vote, a no vote on this amendment to strike. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's move it on. Mr. Brand. Uh, 
You know, the, the, we don't have a perfect lead-based taste test kit, uh, but we have one that's certainly good enough to move forward at this time. Uh, I don't know that the general lady is going to uh, take us to a vote here, but I do have a suspicion if we take it to the vote on the to a vote on the floor that uh, the general lady from California might prevail, and that may be just what we ought to do at this point. Uh, but we're not. Uh, I, I don't have any further substantive comments, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of the Royal Allard. I'm sorry. Yeah, close. Uh, the general lady is recognized to close. One minute. Um, Mr. Let me just simply say that there there is no disagreement that lead poisoning is extremely dangerous, and whether or not the EPA has uh, approved a kit or, or anything else truly is irrelevant to the fact that today we have workers and, and children that are being poisoned by lead, and this amendment would certainly uh, help to ensure that they are pro protected from these uh, health, tragic health hazards of, of lead poisoning. Uh, and with that, I, I close, and um, I, will, I will not ask for a vote at this time. The question is on the Royal Allard Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed no. No. The no's seem to have it. The no's have it. Amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Let me recognize Mr. Adder. Yeah, on. yeah, good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've got an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Adderholt at the appropriate place. In the bill, insert the, the following. Please. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Oh, most of us, I think, realize the, uh, the need in this country to install, upgrade, and replace uh, our drinking water and our water, wastewater infrastructure across the nation. Uh, the drinking water and the clean water state revolving funds provide important funding for that exact purpose. Uh, as we make uh, investment, uh, I think American taxpayers expect uh, that the products that are used to construct this infrastructure, uh, which of course is financed by their tax dollars, uh, would be produced in the United States uh, by American workers. The amendment that I have uh, before you with, uh, along with uh, Congressman Miskloski, uh would simply retain the Buy American procurement that was included in the 2014 omnibus. Um, the concern is that without this amendment, uh, U.S. tax dollars uh, would be used to reward companies who have moved operations and investments and jobs to other countries and uh, to uh, foreign foundries. Instead, uh, taxpayer-financed uh, federal aid programs, especially those that are administered by the um, EPA, should give common-sense preference for American companies and workers who manufacture in the United States. Uh, for over 75 years in this country, the Buy American and the Domestic Preference Law has been a part of U.S. procurement policy. The WARDA bill uh, that we uh, passed earlier uh, this year included the same preference for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund as uh, WIFIA, which is the uh, Water Infrastructure Finance Innovation Authority. This amendment, simply put, would extend this provision uh, which again was included in last year's uh, omnibus bill to the drinking water state revolving fund. And I would uh, ask my colleagues to support this amendment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderholt, uh, Mr. Vesklaski, uh, for the amendment. I have no objection to the amendment, but I'd like to share a few thoughts on it. Uh, while we tend to think the Buy American provisions is pro-U.S. There are often unintended consequences and American-based jobs are negatively affected. In this day and age, multinational corporations have global processes. Many products with materials that originate in the United States are shipped beyond the U.S. border for value-added process and then returned to the United States for additional manufacturing, distribution, and sale. Other business models take components or inputs in foreign, foreign origin and manufacture those products here in the United States by American workers. Therefore, preferential provisions like these often tend to be a double-edged sword, helping some while hurting their neighbors, and I see both impacts in my own congressional district back home. As a result, we end up having to debate on whether the iron and steel was melted and poured in America 
rather than focusing on the best way to create long-term, high-paying jobs that will be rooted in the American economy. We need to adopt policies that foster innovative thinking, economic growth for all, rather than restrictive policies that promote some opportunities for a few. Therefore, I offer no objection to the amendment with the commitment that we can work together to find flexibility within this policy that we're not harming U.S. jobs. The U.S. manufacturing industry is already filling the cost of EPA's heavy-handed regulations, which serve as enough of a dampener. They don't need to be further hampered by requirements that drive up their costs. With that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Piskolaski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Mr. Adold has stated the facts of the amendment uh, clearly in response to the Chairman's concerns, would point out that that's one reason Mr. Adderholt has included three exceptions that can be appealed, including uh, if the process is inconsistent with the public interest, and would ask that my colleagues support the Mr. Adderholt's amendment. Mr. Patai. I rise in support of the amendment and uh, would just incorporate the Chairman's uh, remarks and my colleague, this makes sense, there are exceptions in place, and we should do this in our own authentic interests as a nation, and our uh, counterpart nations around the world do similar types of activities when building infrastructure. Thank you. Mr. Bishop. Mike. I rise also in support of the amendment. Uh, uh, this amendment really uh, helps our steel industry and many, many, many uh, components of our defense uh, are having, uh, we depend upon foreign uh, uh, production of, of, of the products that go into that, uh, which uh, brings us to some extent, uh, uh, puts us at the mercy of, of, uh, of forces outside of our control. So to the extent that we can keep a steel industry strong, which is necessary for national defense and for other infrastructure. I think we should support that, and I support the amendment. Mr. Laurel. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I rise uh, as well in support of the amendment. Uh, it keeps the uh, drinking water state revolving fund in line. It's consistent with other uh, federal infrastructure programs. It re makes that requirement uh, a preference for uh, American iron and steel products. Uh, we've seen in the past that the Buy American programs have created and maintained American manufacturing jobs. Um, and it also ensures that taxpayer dollars don't reward companies that have moved, moved good manufacturing jobs overseas. Um, we, hit, we need to, as a nation, go back to building things again instead of just consuming things that are made overseas. It's a good amendment. I support it, and I urge my colleagues to support it as well, and I'm glad it's going to be accepted. Ms. Kapter. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ring in strong here for American Made Steel. Uh, let me just say, in the, the interest of disclosure, I represent major uh, companies like uh, U.S. Steel, uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, Worthington Steel, and uh, you can just feel as these companies recover with some of their product going into the natural gas industry, which is uh, experiencing a boom uh, across this country, you can just feel our economies being lifted. And this is a time for us to help our own country. Uh, obviously, in the infrastructure program, steel is an extraordinarily important uh, component. It means jobs and prosperity here at home. It means a strong defense. It means America restoring her muscle and her manufacturing might. I rise in strong support, and I thank the committee for listening. Gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to follow up on the words of my colleague from Ohio, as well as uh, rise in strong support my friends from Alabama and Indiana in their Buy American Amendment. I'm a firm believer that U.S. taxpayer dollars should buy American iron and steel rather than that of foreign competitors who won't even play by the same rules that we do. Uh, the language is already included in the 2014 omnibus bill, which makes that even easier to support for all of us. And I hope my colleagues will join us in protecting American jobs. Mr. Adderholt is recognized to close. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just in closing, I just uh, like to say it's imperative that Congress retain this Buy American provision and this approach bill because at the bottom, at the end of the day, it will help uh, American business and help American workers, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Question is on the Adderholt Amendment. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Mr. Moran. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have Amendment 3 at the desk. We can consider amendment, offered by, amendment offered by Mr. Moran. We ask that it be considered. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with.
So, Mr. Chairman, this bill before us includes $470 million to pre-fund the expected shortfall in FY 2014 fire costs. Already, the bill's funding allocation of $470 million is out of date. Just last week, the administration sent up a supplemental that includes a new estimate of a $615 million shortfall in FY14 fire costs. We need some relief from these ever-escalating fire costs that are taking a larger and larger share of the Interior Bill's allocation. In FY14 fire costs, which include current fire spending as well as repayment of previously borrowed funds, it cost 12 percent or three and a half billion dollars of our subcommittee's allocation. Without some relief, this bill, uh, fire, wildland fire, will take up almost 14 percent or four billion of the subcommittee's allocation. Now, we've been diligent in fully funding fire costs at the historical 10-year average, but the rapid rise in fire costs is sorely testing our funding capabilities. Just the last year, the 10-year historical average increased by $429 million. You add that to the now expected $615 million shortfall in FY14, and we're faced with a billion 40, uh, with with a billion forty-four million dollar increase in just one year. That's why we're proposing to fund the FY14 fire shortfall of six hundred fifteen million as emergency spending, a shortfall that has increased by one hundred and forty-five million in just two months is neither planned nor predictable. It's an emergency. We want to acknowledge that this $615 million in funding is just a short-term fix to fix what is a long-term problem. That's the biggest problem in this bill right now, the biggest impediment to our meeting our responsibilities. The best way to fix it is to support the proposal uh, by our friend from Idaho, Mr. Simpson. He treats la the largest wildfires as the disasters that they really are. How are they different from floods? We can't control them. The large ones, which comprise only 1 percent of the total number of fires, consume a third of all the fire costs. The Simpson bill would fund these large fires through the existing disaster budget cap by providing relief from the escalating fire costs that the subcommittee is facing. Myself and many members of this committee on both sides of the aisle are co-sponsors of the Simpson legislation. It's been endorsed by the administration, as we previously mentioned, and many of the national groups that deal with fire issues. I'm hopefully hopeful that we can get the long-term relief that the Simpson bill provides done this year. But in the meantime, I'm offering this short-term fix because it has the added benefit of free freeing up $470 million to spend on another important program in the bill. Uh, if this amendment were adopted, we could put that money into the clean water and safe drinking water infrastructure programs. We could bring them almost back to the enacted level. We'd add $365 million to the clean water fund and $105 million to the safe drinking water fund. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the bill and the budget request disproportionately cut the clean water fund by 30 percent and safe drinking water by 17 percent. This would restore that money. Uh, if these levels in, uh, that are in the bill now are enacted into law, all we're doing is shifting the burden to the taxpayers at the local level. The greatest nation in the world ought to be able to provide clean, potable water and functioning sewer systems to our citizens. And that's what this amendment would do. It would fund uh, wildland fires in the way they ought to be funded. Uh, it would support the, uh, the Simpson legislation. Uh, the administration would support it, and then we could adequately fund our water infrastructure. I think it's a good amendment, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Calvert. I uh, reluctantly rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, as he knows, I certainly <laughs> sympathize with the intent of the gentleman's <laughs> amendment. This bill is, however, is not the appropriate vehicle to address emergency funding uh, the administration has requested for wild land fire. I would remind colleagues uh, that there is an emergency supplemental request that has re received one week ago that's proposing 
$615 million for emergency fire suppression activities for fiscal year 2014. The committee and the Congress have not yet acted on the supplemental request. The bill we are marking up today provides regular appropriations for the agencies funded within the Interior, Environment and Related Agency Subcommittee for fiscal year 2015 and should not be used as a vehicle for emergency funding. Discussions regarding whether to provide emergency supplemental appropriations for wildland fire uh, suppression activities should be held for the debate on the supplemental bill. This issue is also a part of a larger discussion we're having all year regarding exactly how we should be funding wildland fire suppression. I'm a member of the Budget Committee where much of this debate is taking place. I've requested that the Chairman uh, hold hearings uh, on this issue so we have a full and open debate, opportunity for hear from all uh, viewpoints. I think most of the members of this committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, are on Mr. Simpson's bill. Uh, there's a lot of support for it. Uh, we'll have oppor opportunity to, to address the shortfalls uh, uh, for the fiscal year 2015 in a conference with the Senate as we did uh, in the 2014 conference. Lastly, I would remind the gentleman that the bill before us today funds the state revolving loan fund at the level requested in the President's budget. So again, I would appreciate the gentleman's intent, but encourage my colleagues to vote no on the amendment. Ms. Lowy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of the Moran Amendment to designate $615 million in this bill as emergency spending for wildfires and increase funding for water infrastructure by $470 million. Wildfires like tornadoes, hurricanes, threaten lives, damage property, wreak havoc on communities. We shouldn't also allow them to burn through all the funds in this appropriations bill. Once again, we're seeing the current failed process play out with the administration's request for additional wildfire funding already exceeding the amount provided in this bill. Many of us have already sponsored a bill to designate some of these costs as emergency spending. I hope that those who have already expressed support for that bill can now also support this amendment. This amendment provides additional funds to address the water infrastructure crisis in this country. In a 2011 drinking water infrastructure survey, EPA found that nationally 384.2 billion in drinking water upgrades are needed over the next 20 years. And in 2008, EPA reported that approximately 300 billion is needed for wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Failure to replenish the state revolving loan funds will only increase the cost for our state and local governments, slow the improvements of this vital infrastructure. We can't pass this burden on to our constituents. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Is there further discussion? Ms. McCollum. Mr. Chair, I would like to ask the uh, author of the amendment, Mr. Moran, to yield for a question. Mm. Happy to. Uh, Mr. Moran, in the supplemental, there is money for uh, the wild uh, wildfires. Is mm -hmm. that not correct? Correct. And so with the money that would be coming into the supplemental to offset this, this cost of the wildfires, you're just directing that uh, money be used to provide more opportunities for, uh, for, for clean, safe drinking water. Yeah. And because the administration has only recently uh, submitted this supplemental, the administration very well could be in support of your amendment. Yes, Am I doing the chain of events correct, sir? Absolutely. And thank you very much, Ms. McCollum, for raising that issue. And, and uh, uh, I respectfully disagree with the conclusion of Chairman Calvert. Uh, it, it, it's not really logical to say that we ought not do this because we're going to do it in the supplemental. If you're going to do it in the supplemental, why are you putting $470 million in this bill. When we do the supplemental, there's no way we can take that money and reimburse the, the safe drinking water and, and clean water state revolving funds. The administration did cut the, the municipal wastewater systems by 30 percent, but that's because they had to get in under the budget cap that we, uh, that we agreed to, the, the, the total allocation. 
because they wanted to fund adequate money for wildland fires. So if we're going to take care of wildland fires and the supplemental, why have that money in this bill now? Let's put it where it needs to be so that our local taxpayers don't have to bear the cost of municipal wastewater and safe drinking water systems in our local communities. That's why it makes sense to fix it now and then provide the money for wildland fires in the supplemental. I really thank the, chair, the, the lady for uh, raising the issue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think this, this provides us with a win-win, a win to, uh, uh, you know, for putting out fires and a, and a win for clean drinking water. So I would encourage support for the Moran Amendment. I yield back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Simpson. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, first let me thank you, all the members for the recognition that we have a real problem. Uh, and uh, many of you, all the members of the subcommittee, I believe, are co-sponsors of the bill that would address this. Unfortunately, this is not the way to do it. I don't know what's going to happen in the supplemental. I don't know whether it's going to include wildland, uh, fi the fighting supplemental, the $615 million or not. I don't know whether $470 million or $615 million is the right amount of money. I will tell you that we, were, we are working on a variety of fronts to try to get the wildland firefighting legislation that I think a majority of us uh, want to see passed, passed in this Congress. And I would remind you that this is the first, I guess the second step in a long process. First was the subcommittee markup, this is the second step, then we go to the floor, and then we go to conference. So there's a long time between now and when we actually, when Chairman Calvert uh, actually conferences a bill. We ought to know more at that time about what happens with the supplemental and wildland, wildland firefighting, and we ought to know what happens with uh, our legislation uh, at that time. And at that time, in conference, you can make adjustments, if necessary, based on the events that happen between now and then. So I would, while I appreciate uh, what the gentleman is trying to do and the recognition that uh, wildland firefighting is a huge issue in this budget, as uh, as uh, Mr. Moran and I talked about uh, many times when I was chairman of the committee and he was the ranking member and when he was the chairman and I was the ranking member. And I can tell you that nobody wants to solve this problem more than the current chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Calvert, because it does put extraordinary pressure on this budget and all other aspects of this budget. So it's an issue that is moving forward that we are trying to solve. I appreciate what he's trying to do. I just don't believe that this is the way to do it and I think it might make it more difficult to push our wildland firefighting bill uh, if, uh, if this were to be adopted in, uh, in this manner. So while I appreciate it and I appreciate all the members that have supported this, uh, I would vote against this amendment and know that we are going to be working on this as it gets through the, as it moves through the process. And I would encourage the members to vote against the amendment. <laughs> Mr. Moran is recognized to close. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we have made uh, arguments. We're going to do the supplemental. We're going to support the money for wildland fire. But when we do, it's going to be too late to put that money into our municipal wastewater and safe drinking water systems. And when we don't put that money in, when we accept another 30 percent cut from the existing level of funding, who pays the bill? Our local property taxpayers pay that bill. And in many communities, they don't have that money, and so our municipal wastewater systems aren't upgraded. Uh, people's uh, the, the uh, need to have safe drinking water is compromised. It seems to me this is the right thing to do, and, and it's clear we're going to support that supplemental. We're going to fully fund wildland fires, and, uh, but we also ought to fully fund uh, safe drinking water and uh, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. So I'd urge an aye uh, vote on this amendment, Mr. Chairman. Question is on the Moran Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed will say no. No. The no seem to have it. <coughs> we'll have to ask for roll call, Mr. Chairman. Roll call is requested. A sufficient number responding. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday, no. Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cole? Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Crenshaw? Mr. Crenshaw, no. Mr. Cuellar? Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson? Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro? Mr. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent? Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Farr? Mr. Farr, aye. Mr. Fatah? 
Mr. Fata, aye. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Mr. Feelingheisen. Mr. Feelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Hera Butler. Ms. Hera Butler, no. Mr. Honda. Mr. Honda, aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kingston. Mr. Latham. Mr. Latham, no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Aye. Ms. McCollum, aye. Mr. Moran. Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Nunnally. Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens, aye. Mr. Pastor. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Robo Allard. Mr. Robo Allard, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, no. Mr. Vyskoski. Mr. Vyskoski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, no. Are there members who wish to be recorded or to change their vote? Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 21, the nays are 27. The amendment is not agreed to. Ms. Pingree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. Pingree, page 2, line 20, reduce the dollar amount by $48 million. That's Without great. objection, the reading is dispensed with. John ladies recognize. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I get to my amendment, I just want to join in with everyone else in uh, recognizing Mr. Moran and saying how sad I will be to see him leaving as a new member of this committee. He's been a wonderful mentor to me. And people have used so many great adjectives to describe him today. Um, none more frequent than passionate. And so uh, I will echo that, but I will also say I think one of the reasons that Mr. Moran is so passionate is because he does such an excellent job of sorting out those issues that someone has to take up and become a champion and stick with it. You know, we all have our moments. I'm certainly passionate about the Brewers Caucus and defending things in my own district. But the truth is, Mr. Moran cuts across all issues and finds those things that we need to pay attention to. And then he doesn't give up the fight. And he makes articulate and thoughtful arguments and doesn't let us back down without making sure we know why we are doing something wrong when we do. So I want to thank him and uh, say I will just add my name to those who will miss him and uh, will call him frequently to ask for advice when he's no longer with us. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, to the chairman, thank you for working so closely with our subcommittee members and crafting this bill. It's been nice to have you as our new chair of the committee. We've had a lot of interesting and informative hearings and good bipartisan dialogue about issues such as ocean acidification, invasive species, the national parks, issues facing Native Americans. Uh, we've discussed a lot of important programs that affect our wildlife, our refuges, our farms, our forests. I really appreciate all that I've been able to learn and to have worked with you on so many areas. There are a lot of areas in this legislation I am proud of. Some of these we talked about in our own subcommittee markup. Unfortunately, one I just want to bring up today that didn't receive the funding that it needs is the Forest Legacy Program. The amendment I had before you would restore the funds to the Forest Legacy Forest, prog the Forest Service Forest Legacy Program, which is cut by about 50 percent in this bill. The Forest Legacy Program is a partnership with the states that help protect our nation's most sensitive forest lands. It protects privately owned forest lands through a voluntary program that uses conservation easements and legally binding agreements, all while keeping the properties in private hands. We need a way for our local communities' landowners 
to ensure that our most valuable forests are kept intact and protected from the threat of fragmentation and development. This program is a way to ensure access to forest lands for sportsmen and those who love the outdoors in Maine and across the country. The budget, President's budget request would protect over 200,000 acres of forest in 44 different locations. But the committee mark will reduce this to only six forests. States like Idaho, Georgia, North Carolina, Utah will not see any forest legacy funding under this amount. So in order to pay for this vital program, I'm suggesting that we institute the same oil and gas program inspection fee for onshore operations that currently applies to offshore facilities. BLM has oversight responsibility for over 100,000 oil and gas wells. That number is increasing with a decreasing inspection budget. This means less safety for workers, less safety for communities. As of today, the BLM program does not benefit from industry fees, um, but with the same fee applied to onshore sites as is currently applied to the offshore sites, we could prevent safety hazards, ensure safer oil and gas facilities and communities. I would like to work with the chair on both of these issues, restoring funding to the Forest Legacy Program and ensuring that inspections of offshore oil and gas facilities can occur with greater resources. I am willing to withdraw my amendment if the chairman could agree to work with me and my colleagues on these issues moving forward. Chairman Keller. I appreciate the uh, gentlelady's remarks. While I understand that the forest legacy program is critically important to protecting working forest lands and maintaining rural jobs, I just disagree with the proposed offset in the amendment. The reason is simple. Onshore leases for oil and gas and other minerals gen generate more than four, million uh, four billion excuse me, annually in revenues for the Treasury. So I don't believe we should impose additional fees on those energy producers. I do remain supportive of the Forest Legacy Program, which is a hallmark of public-private partnerships. These projects often exceed the required 25 percent or non-federal match as, as much as 50 percent. These are the kinds of programs we should be supporting, where the federal government works in partnerships with states and local governments, non-governmental organizations regarding priorities of the states and local communities. Therefore, while I cannot support this amendment with the offset proposed, I commit to work uh, with you to work uh, uh, on finding, uh, finding other ways to do this as the bill moves forward through the process to support the Forest Legacy Program. Uh, thank you very much, oh Chairman God. Calvert. I, well, I thought my offset was brilliant. I had a feeling <laughs> you might not view it in the same way. So I understand that that is not likely something you're going to work on. But I do appreciate your willingness to help work on the Forest Legacy Program. And we'll look forward to doing with you, that with you. And we'll withdraw my amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Amendment is withdrawn. Further amendments? Mr. Amadee? Yeah, and her eyebrows are your husband. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read that it be considered. Amendment offered by Mr. Amaday. The reading is dispensed with. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you. Uh, returning to the American iron and steel subject, and by American, uh, as uh, my colleague from Alabama uh, adequately uh, discussed the history of this and how we've extended it to other uh, public water projects and stuff like that, um, one of the things that we had uh, also discussed in that discussion were some unintended consequences of that. About 120 days ago, EPA issued guidance that indicated that if American iron and steel was shipped to a foreign country for a process such as vulcanization and then shipped back for final manufacturing, that it was no longer considered American iron and steel. My amendment seeks basically to say that if the steel is melted and cast in the United States, is shipped over for a foreign process, then returned to the United States for final manufacturing, that it should not be disqualified from the preferential status of Buy American for purposes of those, uh, those uh, public water infrastructure products. I urge your support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Calvert. I support the gentleman's uh, amendment. As noted earlier, we need to ensure that American manufacturing jobs are not hurt by these provisions. We need to work together to find flexibility within these requirements to ensure U.S. jobs are not put at a disadvantage. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran. Mr. Visklosky. 
Or you may be fine. Oh, you No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is what you want, right? <laughs> no, no. You're doing your business. This is not what I want. What are you talking about? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do not rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. I appreciate the recognition, Mr. Chairman, uh, but would point out, uh, as we did in the earlier debate, uh, there are three exemptions that are provided uh, in the Adderholt uh, Amendment. One is uh, if the results are inconsistent with the public interest. Uh, secondly, if the products are not produced in the United States uh, or if there is a significant uh, price increase. Uh, the gentleman uh, brings up a problem that has occurred, and one of the problems is for the manufacturer himself or herself. They are not the ones that apply for the exemption. It has to be the governmental entity receiving the funds. Uh, so there is not a clear connection in asking for one of those exemptions. Again, I'm not opposed uh, to what the gentleman is doing, but would encourage him or others who have a similar problem uh, to have that discussion take place with the contracting entity uh, and potentially bring this to EPA's uh, attention because it is a problem for you. Uh, my only concern today is it's rubber today, it's glass next year, and I don't want to see a string of exemptions, but again, appreciate uh, what the gentleman's attempting to do. Gentleman's recognized to close, Mr. Amaday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I, I would just indicate that this was necessitated in response to EPA's specific direction, which thereby made municipal contracting authorities and those similar um, want to avoid even having to ask for an exemption or clarification, although I agree with the tenor of it and, and would uh, urge your support as uh, something that's a logical extension of supporting by America and American Steel, but also American Jobs and Manufacturing. Question is on the Amaday Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Moran. Go for it, Dave. Okay. Chair, I've already got the amendment number four at the desk that I'd consider that I'd ask to be considered. Amendment. Clerk will designate. Amendment offered by Mr. Moran. Page 59, beginning on line. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Uh, Mr. Chairman, African elephants are facing extinction today because they are being killed at an alarming rate by poachers for their ivory. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that more than 35,000 elephants are killed every year. From an estimated 1.3 million African elephants in 1981, less than half a million exist today. And with the poaching of African elephants accelerating, this decline is rapidly reaching the tipping point. Ivory from elephant tusks contribute between seven and ten billion dollars a year to the illegal trade in wildlife. The Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist group Al-Shabaab is reported to receive as much as 40 percent of its financing from the sale of elephant, ivory, and other poached wildlife. And according to the United Nations Security Council, a number of other terrorist organizations are funded in part by the sale of elephant ivory. If we're going to stop the slaughter of African elephants, we need to stop the trade in illegal ivory. After China, the United States is the world's largest consumer of ivory. And while I applaud the actions of the U.S. In te that we're taking in curbing the trade in illegal ivory, we have to recognize that some of these actions have generated concern here in the United States. Part of the problem is that those in the illegal trade of ivory have gotten very good at disguising their illegal products. They can make new ivory look as though it's antique ivory. They can cut it into small pieces and so on. The result is that it's becoming harder and harder to tell the difference between legal ivory and illegal ivory. U.S. law has for years restricted the commercial trade in ivory. However, the recently updated Fish and Wildlife Service rules on the ivory trade here in the U.S. have focused renewed attention on this issue. My concern with the rider that is in this bill, Section 115, is that it endorses the status quo and ignores the impact that the illegal ivory trade within the U.S. is having on African elephants' survival. When it comes to the survival of these elephants, 
the status quo is not acceptable. I yield back my time, Mr. I appreciate my friend's thoughtful comments regarding the alarming level of elephant poaching in certain parts of Africa and the need to do something about it. Without questions, Republicans do not want to see elephants go extinct. After all, it is our national symbol. Uh, but perhaps no other issue this year has generated so much public input from such a diverse range of interests. We've heard from orchestra musicians, art museums, wildlife conservation organizations, collectors of fine antiques, ranging from chess pieces to pool cues to firearms, and nearly everyone and everything between. They are united in their support for elephants, but they're also united in their opposition to a new Fish and Wildlife Service policy regarding ivory. The Fish and Wildlife Service recently made a unilateral decision to ban the trade of ivory. It has been, been legally in the United States for years, in some cases generations, mm -hmm including expensive family heirlooms and rare musical instruments. No doubt this is a complex issue. If, it's an, if it's an easy solution could be found, the Fish and Wildlife Service would have already found it. But why should law-abiding U.S. citizens be punished when the heart of the problem is overseas? With that in mind, right now I can think of no better policy than to keep the status quo legal trade of ivory so that collectors, musicians, and others can get on with their lives. But there's a, but if there's a smarter solution out there that can be found between now and conference, I'll be happy to work with my friend, uh, keep our lines of communication open, and try to continue to work out uh, a way to fix this. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm glad to hear that assurance of uh, possible cooperation down the road on this, because I think this is a, uh, a serious issue, and uh, uh, Mr. Moran's amendment uh, is, uh, is addressing that, I think, in a, in a serious way. It's, al it's also true that our Homeland Security Bill, uh, recently reported, uh, deals with this issue. We, uh, we have in our, in our committee report a, uh, a note that um, illegal wildlife trafficking is one of the largest international criminal enterprises. And we urge in the Homeland Security Bill uh, for our, our government to work with uh, uh, U.S. and international law enforcement partner countries to share information deal with this illegal wildlife trafficking, particularly the trafficking of African elephant ivory. Um, it's reached a crisis level. According to the Wildlife Conservation Society field scientists in Africa, in 2012 alone, 35,000 elephants were killed for their ivory. That's equal to one every 15 minutes. Uh, that's contributed to a dramatic decline in elephant populations. African elephant populations have declined by two-thirds to around 400,000 uh, <coughs> elephants since 1980. They're predominantly being killed simply for the ivory in their tusks. Uh, a majority of this illegally obtained ivory ends up as trinkets and carvings, uh, primarily in China. But the same goods are smuggled into the U.S. and sold online and in stores disguised as antiques. Uh, the U.S. is the second largest market today for, Ill, for, com, for ivory in the world. There was a, a, a study a few years ago of 650 shops in 16 U.S. cities that showed that as much as 30 percent of the 24,000 pieces for sale were potentially illegal, merited further testing. As uh, Mr. Moran says, this uh, is such a lucrative trade, it's been taken over by criminal syndicates. All are also involved, of course, in human trafficking and drugs, weapons. There's growing evidence that extremist groups are using poaching as a source of income. That would include uh, Coney's uh, Lord's Resistance Army, mm -hmm. the Salika rebels, the Janjaweed militias in Sudan, al-Shabaab. Now, to address this very real concern, in February this year, the administration announced a comprehensive national strategy for combating wildlife trafficking a whole-of-government approach to address the wildlife trafficking crisis at home and abroad. A key part of that national strategy is for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to close several regulatory exceptions to the existing ban on the import, export, and commercial sale of ivory to the U.S. to bring the regulations more in line with uh, existing statutes. If, that, if the national strategy were fully implemented, the commercial trade in ivory would be restricted to items <laughs> that qualify, that really qualify as antiques under the Endangered Species Act. 
Now, contrary to some rumors, there'd be no effect on the private ownership of ivory. Um, even so, the Fish and Wildlife Service has already shown a willingness to accommodate reasonable concerns here by modifying the director's order to address problems outlined by musicians and by other parties. So I think the uh, a, a section in the bill is a broad overreaction. Uh, Mr. Moran's amendment would correct that. I urge its adoption. Uh, Mr. McCullum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not want to repeat the list of terrorists uh, that are using um, trafficked ivory uh, that uh, Mr. Price just, just brought up. But the, the reason why they're doing this, folks, is ivory can generate up to $1,800 per pound. And that's why it has become such a, a, uh, a, a tool that's being used by many of the extremist groups and groups on the State Department's list of terrorists for easy cash. So how do, you, how do you stop that from happening? Well, the U.S. took leadership on ivory ship, on ivory, uh, and it's, it's having a tremendous impact. Uh, last fall, the United States crushed its stockpile of six tons of confiscated ivory. Within two months, folks, the Chinese government stepped up and they crushed about uh, six uh, uh, tons of confiscated ivory. So we're starting to change the dynamics and uh, stop this illegal trafficking of, of ivory with some of the actions that the United States has taken as, as leaders on this. So what we're simply trying to do, what Fish and Wildlife is trying to do, and what they're going to be working on is requiring the seller to demonstrate that the items qualify for an exemption the African Elephant Conservation Act, prior uh, sale, making it much easier to enforce. Uh, and this will bring the law much more on, in compliance with uh, things that uh, we do in, in other parts of, of, of statute. We, we can figure out the language to this. I'm confident we can. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to vote for this amendment uh, today, Mr. Moran's amendment. But I know that there's, there's good people on both sides of the aisle, the governments and governments all around the world. We can come up with a solution to this. And I hear you loud and clear that you're willing to do that. Am I correct? That's correct. So I will vote for the Moran Amendment today. But I look forward to, uh, by the time this bill comes to the floor, or even prior to coming to the floor, that we sit down and, and work out some language. And with that, I yield back. Ms. Louie. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank Chairman Calvert for agreeing to work with us as this bill moves through the process because this is such an essential issue. So much has been said, everything has been said, I'm not going to add to it. And I know my chairman, uh, Chairwoman Granger is very committed to working out a resolution. We don't have to have antique dealers versus Al-Shabaab. I am sure that we can work out some language. And I've been particularly concerned about many of the dealers taking this product, making it look like it's an antique, but it's not even really an antique. So again, I'm not going to repeat everything. I think it's essential that we do something about it. And I look forward to working with you and Chairwoman Granger and my colleagues to find some solutions to this. What I am most concerned about um, and many important points were mentioned, but the fact that groups like Al-Shabaab and uh, Joseph Kony should be profiting and paying for their <coughs> evil acts with these uh, elephant tusks. So I thank you very much for your willingness to work with us, and I look forward to the process. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief as well. Uh, I just want to express my... Uh, uh, concern over the devastating loss of these magnificent animals. And I know this has been a priority uh, for Chairman Granger and for uh, Ranking Member Lowy. Uh, it's, we do not want to be the generation that saw the elephants disappear uh, from our midst. And we are fast becoming that generation. And that would be an appalling legacy to leave behind. Uh, so I fully support uh, every effort we can make uh, to end this uh, horrendous trafficking in ivory. Uh, at the same time, I recognize the concerns that uh, Chairman Calvert has, uh, has mentioned. Uh, I have uh, constituents uh, who I respect, 
uh, who are very legitimate uh, possessors of antiques and who are very concerned with how this will affect them. And of course, we've seen uh, the stories uh, all too real about the interruption of uh, legitimate musical in instruments uh, from orchestras visiting the country. But I, as others have expressed, think this is not beyond our capability of resolving. Uh, we can stop this trafficking and we can make sure that we uh, preserve people's ability to possess the antiques that they have and, and, and trade them. Uh, we can do this, and I fully support that effort, uh, and I appreciate Mr. Moran uh, offering this amendment um, because uh, we just have to put an end to this horrible uh, slaughter of these absolutely majestic, incredible creatures, and I yield back. Mr. Moran is recognized to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand that uh, Chairman Calvert uh, wants to be responsive uh, to the uh, concerns, legitimate concerns, from a number of diverse groups that, as Mr. Schiff uh, cited. Uh, but nevertheless, we need to do something about it, something stronger than what is being done now, because there's far too dramatic an attrition of uh, African elements and the fact that 40 percent of al-Shabaab is being funded by ivory tusks, that's not acceptable. But if we could get the assurance of Chairman Calvert that we will be able to continue to work in a bipartisan fashion to find a solution that addresses any legitimate concerns that these groups have, yet uh, still maintain uh, the U.S. leadership in stemming the illegal trade of ivory, uh, we could withdraw uh, this amendment. Uh, as long as we can work together for the constructive yield? conclusion. I'd, I'd yield to Chairman. I'll be Collins. happy to work with the gentleman uh, to see if we can't find a common solution. Yeah, okay. We'll withdraw it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Withdraw the amendment. We withdraw the amendment. Amendment is withdrawn. Are there other amendments? Mr. Laurel. <laughs> Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. DeLauro. The reading is dispensed with. General ladies recognized. an average of over $20 million a year to subsidize just 109 timber jobs in southeast Alaska. I repeat, 109 jobs, that is $200,000 in subsidies for every single job. It is time to stop using federal dollars to subsidize the industrial clear-cutting of the Tongass National Forest in southeast Alaska, our nation's largest and wildest national forest. The Tongass is the crown jewel of our forest system, one of the world's five remaining most, mostly intact temperate rainforests. Its centuries-old trees provide critical habitat for wolves, grizzly bears, wild salmon, bald eagles, and other wildlife. It is a vital piece of Alaska's tourism industry, one of the largest sources of private sector growth in that region. And yet, we are still continuing to subsidize the logging of the Tongass, a great taxpayer expense, at great tax, taxpayer expense, and doing great harm to the environment long after the economy of the state has moved on. By comparison, less than $8 million is spent on fish and wildlife programs, and less than $6 million on recreation, even though together these industries pump more than $2 billion into the regional economy annually and support more than 17,000 jobs. We need to stop subsidizing a handful of jobs in the timber industry at the expense of this national treasure. In 2010, Secretary Vilsack announced that was, a goal, that was the goal of the USDA, and yet tens of millions of hard-earned taxpayers' dollars continue to go to logging of the Tongass every year. The disregard for the waste of taxpayer dollars and the health of the Tongass National Forest needs to stop. We have a responsibility to leave our economy, our government, our environment in better shape than we inherited it. And if we want to get serious about cutting government waste, the annual subsidy to prop up the timber industry and clear cut the rainforest in Alaska is a good place to start. In 2007, the House passed a similar amendment in 2007, and I repeat, the House passed 
a similar amendment on a bipartisan vote. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Chairman Calvert. I uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, I was just handed this amendment about an hour ago, uh, but I'm familiar with the issue. I've been um, up in the Tongass a number of times. Alaska, I go up, up there quite often. I can't think of any state that uh, reveres its environment and does more for the environment than the state of Alaska. It's a, truly a, a wonderful place. The Forest Service, however, committed to offer four 10-year timber sales, each with a volume of 150 to 200 million board feet. The Forest Service has not yet followed through on this commitment, so the report language included directs the Forest Service to move forward with a 10-year timber sales. In 2000, uh, 2013, only 36 million board feet were harvested. The 230 million board feet discrepancy between what is allowed and what is being harvested is well below the market demand and well below the amount needed to sustain the timber industry in the region. The language simply directs the Forest Service to do what they have promised to do for the past several years. That is the same language that was included in last year and was included in the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2014. This language merely reflects current law. So I oppose the gentlelady's amendment. Is there further discussion? Ms. McCollum. Mr. Chair, I support the amendment. And uh, there is, when the clear cutting takes place, it affects the topsoil, the crust, whatever you want to call of the rainforest. And below that, we heard from some of the native communities there, they're concerned about the effect that it's going to have on, on the drinking water. And I'm trying to think of the correct geological term, so I'm sure I'll hear about it after I probably say it wrong, but I think it's, it, 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 it's car karst or something like that. When we were there, they were talking about how if you're not careful, if you don't do this in the right way, when you go through and you clear cut, you put this, this topsoil that, that's the, that the trees are in after they're uprooted and the soil below, and it literally causes Rudy. the land to Rudy. fall into the aquifers um, underneath and, and potentially damaging drinking water. So um, I think there's a lot of, uh, lot of issues that, that we can um, talk about when it comes to the, the Tongass, whether it's, it's the rarity of it, the wildlife, the, the, just the clear cutting of these, these magnificent trees, but also water quality and some of the concerns that the indigenous population had up there. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Moran. Ms. Herrera Butler. I just wanted to add a little bit of um, convert, a, a little bit of uh, perspective on this, and um, we we're dealing with. I'm, I completely support the language in the underlying bill, and it is so important that we move forward with it. And here's why: if you look at the science of forest health, we've had 20 in Gifford Pinchot in my neck of the woods. For the last 20, 25 years, we have operated under the current, uh, not under, um, we've, we've had the laws in place to be able to selectively harvest for the health of the forest and the health of the species, but we haven't done it for many, many reasons. The, the language in the underlying bill is encouraging us to set the targets and harvest up to the agreed upon levels. We're not talking about commercially logging um, federal forest. Here's what's at stake if we don't. Right now, in my neck of the woods, we have over 40 species that are on the brink of getting into endangered species status because our forests are in decay. There are 24 times more, 20, methane gas is released and it's 25 time, 24 times more potent than CO2. And what happens when you leave a log on the forest floor to, to die? It, it, it produces that methane. We're talking about catastrophic wildfires. And people will say, and I will agree, so, so the climate may be changing. So maybe more people are moving into rural areas. You also have to agree that when we have stopped going in and cleaning up our forests and selectively harvesting to manage the health of the forest, that we're creating tinder boxes. So the, what the Forest Service is proposing here is not overstepping and trying to log this national forest. They're trying to put some timber sales in place that, consequently, if we allow them to move forward, will pay for the jobs on the ground. 
the forest service used to pay for it's a bit for 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 the work it does in our forests, but because we st have pretty much stopped managing our federal forests, they're in disarray. They're ripe for beetle and bug infestation and disease. They're creating these catastrophic fires that are endangering state lands and private lands, and it's hurting the species that we're trying to protect. So we're not talking about commercially logging. We're talking about some common sense measures that are based in science. If, you, if, you, if we're really going to stick to science on this, the science is in. We know that this will produce health in the forests if we keep this underlying language. So I, I urge rejection of this, this amendment. And I also urge those folks who are not from forested areas. You, I would love to host you out in my area. I would love to take you on a tour. Some folks have. Some folks haven't. Um, we, we want to protect our forests. And part of that means getting in there and managing them. And so with that, I yield back. The gentlelady is recognized to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think what, what we need to do, it's time for the U.S. to, uh, of, of, for the Forest Service to waste, to stop wasting taxpayers' dollars on large-scale industrial logging of old-growth trees. Instead, protect America's rainforest invest in sustainable future for Southeast Alaska. Twelve, ten years ago, I had the opportunity to experience the beauty of the Tongass. I traveled through the forest on an old Navy minesweeper. It's hard to imagine why anyone would want to spoil such a perfect example of nature's magnificence. Especially hard to imagine why, in time of immense fiscal constraint, we would want to give millions of dollars of subsidies every year to the timber industry at the extraordinary cost of $200,000 per job. Over the last 50 years, this national forest has already lost 550,000 acres of old growth trees and been marked by 5,000 miles of logging roads. We should stop threatening what is left of this national forest and the jobs of over 17,000 guides and commercial fishermen in the area to prop up the timber industry. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. The question is on the DeLauro Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed will say no. No. The no's seem to have it. The no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. I ask to dispense of the reading. The amendment offered. Designate. Amendment offered by Mr. Quigley. And the reading is dispensed with by unanimous consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, given the realities of the votes uh, taken so far, I'd uh, like to offer this amendment, but I uh, intend to withdraw it uh, upon my conclusion. More, for more than uh, four decades, the Clean Water Act has protected our right to enjoy safe water to drink and pristine places to swim. Since it was updated in 1972, the Clean Water Act has protected nearly two million miles of streams mm -hmm. and millions of acres of wetlands across our country. The law didn't just protect the health of the Mississippi or our Great Lakes, though. It also recognized the importance of smaller streams and wetlands that create a vast interconnected system. The Clean Water Act worked to preserve this system by stopping the dumping of toxic pollution upstream because healthy downstream lakes and rivers are beholden to the streams and wetlands that feed them. My amendment striking the controversial anti-clean water writer in this bill will help fulfill the Clean Water Act's original promise to make America's waters fishable and swimmable for all. This harmful rider would block the EPA and the Army Corps from moving forward on the administration's proposed clean water rule, effectively shutting down the current public comment period and process. Since the Supreme Court decisions in 2001 and 2006, many wetland streams and small lakes have been put at great risk for more pollution and even destruction. These decisions created a confusing, time-consuming and frustrating process for determining what waters are protected under federal law. In response to that confusion, the EPA proposed a rule that would clarify protection under the Clean Water Act for streams and wetlands, providing greater certainty for landowners while enhancing waterway conservation across the country. The proposed rule is an important step toward restoring Clean Water Act protections for thousands of the streams that feed into our drinking water, serving 30.6 million in the Great Lakes Basin and 117 million Americans across our country. This rule would also ensure the natural resources conservation practices which improve water quality 
and do not destroy wetlands are exempt from dredging or fill permitting requirements. Exempting these practices will make it easier for farmers to undertake these types of conservation projects on their land. Farmers across this country are already incorporating these practices, which include irrigation field ditches, wetland restoration and enhancement, and filter strips. My amendment would allow these important conservation, conservation efforts to continue. Let's be clear. The administration's proposed clean water rule does not add to or expand or broaden the reach of EPA regulations. It simply clarifies protections for small streams and wetlands that contribute to drinking water supplies, filter out pollutants, and help protect us from flooding. In many ways, this bill just shows how much disagreement exists in this committee and this Congress about the best ways to protect our environment. But I hope if there's one thing we can agree on, it's providing clean and safe drinking water for our children for generations to come. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, the gentleman's uh, Ms. Kaptur. She's getting ready to go, Your Honor, Judge. <laughs> Is there further discussion? If not, the gentleman's recognized to close. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I recognize the, the, uh, the political realities in this room and in this committee, but uh, I just want to make it clear. Uh, this is just a reaction to the Supreme Court decisions of 01 and 06, an attempt to, there simply has to be something to fill the void. Shutting down the process makes no sense. I think it's appropriate to let the uh, EPA continue its work. But at this time, I would withdraw this amendment. Thank you. Amendment is withdrawn. Is there further amendments? Ms. Kaptur. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I don't have an amendment, but I have a situation I would like to discuss very briefly, and perhaps as we move to the floor, uh, a story will help move us forward. Mr. Gentlelady, move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. You recognize. All right. In 1987, we introduced the first bill to create the World War II Memorial in Washington. By 2004, we finally dedicated it. And today it remains, uh, now there have been 42 million people who have visited that memorial, and it is extraordinarily popular. Um, the Park Service budget has been constrained over the years, and let me share this story. When the memorial was first opened, of course, it has the rainbow fountain that was improved, and as people came to the memorial, they threw coins in the fountain. And so one of the first challenges we had was to buy proper vacuum cleaners to clean out the money that the American people were throwing into the fountain. Then the Department of Interior decided that a good thing to do uh, to stop this was to put up signs. It's do not throw coins. Well, you know, not everybody reads signs, but a lot of people changed their behavior. They threw in bills, dollar bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, $20 bills. The point that I'm making here is that the American people want to help on a voluntary basis at this memorial and perhaps others. I have been unable to move the bureaucracy to a point where we can allow for contributions. Some are made online, but you know, a lot of people want to be able to somehow make a contribution to help with the upkeep and perhaps the expansion of collections at places like the World War II Memorial. So all I'm asking is for those people that serve on the committee, for people from the Department of Interior who are here, here's a member that would like to help the American people help our legacy uh, parks and memorials. I don't think we found the best way to do it, but with the collective intelligence here, maybe someone or some group of people will help us as we move to the floor to develop a colloquy to urge the department to think more creatively on this topic. I thank the uh, committee for listening, and I look forward to that moment. I hope that wise and caring people will speak to me about this. Thank you very much. Are there further amendments? Mr. Moran. This is the last one. <laughs> Clerk will read. Uh, Amendment offered by Mr. Moran. Page 60, beginning on line 19, strike section 117. Sage Grouse. Gentlemen's recognized. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, section 117 is the majority's attempt to substitute their judgment for the scientists and the biologists who work on the sage grouse issue every day. 
and for good measure, they also want to overturn a legal settlement. This rider that's in the bill would force the Fish and Wildlife Service to violate the terms of a legally binding agreement. That settlement committed the service to make either a not warranted finding or publish a proposed listing rule by September 30th of 2015. This rider that's in the bill would explicitly forbid the Fish and Wildlife Service from doing so and th thus would put the service in breach of the settlement. But that settlement has spurred an unprecedented effort among federal and state agencies, industry and private organizations and individuals to develop and implement adequate conservation measures for the sage grouse. Current planning efforts are on schedule to finalize conservation plans across the West in time for the service to consider them in its decision of whether or not to list the greater sage grouse in 2015. The likely resu result of this rider that my amendment would strike is that congressional interference in the ESA listing process will produce disruption and increased uncertainty among the affected interest groups, landowners, industry, and government agencies and be counterproductive to the conservation efforts that are underway. It would very likely push this issue back into the courts. It would waste the $35 million that we've appropriated in the last three years and ironically, it would increase the likelihood of the listing of the sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act. Now, proponents of this rider claim that the timetable for making a decision is not scientifically based and is being arbitrarily driven by a court deadline. But the reality is that the service already went through a scientifically based process and found in 2010 that the sage grouse warranted listing but was precluded by higher priorities. Well, those high priorities were that the Fish and Wildlife Service simply didn't have the money to do it. The legal settlement merely put the service on a schedule, allowing them to move forward with making listing decisions methodically and in a timely manner. More importantly, the settlement was a wake-up call to other parties and brought them to the table to save the sage grouse, something they should have been doing all along. Members of this committee well understand deadlines. And without a deadline on a listing decision, we're inviting the involved parties to back off the commitments that they have made to sage grouse preservation. A one-year delay will become two, and then three. Opponents of a listing decision have already tipped their hand by introducing legislation providing for a 10-year delay. And what about the sage grouse issue? The sage grouse itself. Call it a hen if you want, uh, but... It is an iconic species of the West, whose population has declined to less than 10% of its historic numbers. It is the proverbial canary in the coal mine. If it goes, it signals the potential collapse of a very important Western ecosystem. That's why this rider is a very bad and a harmful precedent, and I urge my colleagues to join me in removing this rider from the bill. Chairman Calvert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without this provision, the Fish and Wildlife Service will be forced to make a listing decision in FY15. Sage-grouse listing would impact 14 western states from North Dakota to New Mexico and from Washington to California. I want to read a, a quote from the bipartisan Western Governors Association. Western governors support all reasonable management efforts necessary to avoid a threatened or endangered listing of the greater sage grouse by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Based on past experience and recent evidence, the states are rightfully concerned that these listings will fail at recovery while eliminating jobs, curtailing future job growth, devastating state and local economies, and undermining the nation's ability to develop conventional and renewable resources necessary for energy independence. States are further concerned that the Fish and Wildlife Service actions on sage grouse are being driven by litigation. Litigation deadlines that leave the service with no flexibility to take into consideration the extraordinary conservation planning efforts and expenditures at the federal, state, and local levels that the gentleman referred to. The conservation of western grouse is a commonly shared long-term goal 
that should be afforded to an opportunity to demonstrate success that extends beyond any arbitrary federal regulatory deadline so as long as extinction is not imminent. That is why the bill includes Section 117, along with a substantial cross-cut budget for fighting fires and invasive species, restoring habitat, and taking other significant steps to conserve the sage chicken. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. <laughs> Mr. Abbey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, this is the largest listing, proposed listing, acres-wise in the history of the country. Uh, I, I note that, that my friend from the Old Dominion, about 9.2 percent of your state is controlled by the federal government. When you go west of the Rockies, my state, it's about 86 percent. And so when you take a look at the traditional play of this, it's different than the traditional ESA thing because it's a habitat issue. With all due respect, they still have a sage hen hunting season in Nevada. It's not population, it's habitat loss and fragmentation. Acres, not feathers. And so when you say, well, what's the Department of Interior here doing? It's like, well, you have the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of Interior telling BLM, who owns with Forest Service, the vast majority of that 87 percent, hey, we've done a bad job on habitat uh, preservation and keeping their habitat from being fragmented. It's almost like combining all three branches of government within the Department of Interior. And so what do we ask to do in this? We're not saying forget it, go to heck. We're suing you on constitutional grounds. We are saying you people when the, with the listing scheduled, decision scheduled for 2015, really ought not to have it listed and then come back and tell us here's what we need for money to do the right thing by that habitat. What we would like to do is say here's what we would like to do with the right thing in that habitat, which is for the year listing, so that you fish and wildlife know that the landowner, ladies and gentlemen, which in most of sage hen country is the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service, so you can avoid the listing. Do the right thing by the sagebrush step ecosystem. I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to imitate uh, my colleague from Washington, and one of yours said something about passion, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Would do the right thing by the sagebrush step ecosystem before the listing so it can be avoided. Not, we don't have a problem, but Federal government landowner, please put your best foot forward before it's listed rather than after it is. Because when you talk about control of 87% of the surface area of your state, and to be quite honest with you, Nevada too is sagebrush crossroads of the nation. Ask the fish and wildlife people in Sacramento and, and in Denver. It's ground zero. It's the most habitat there is. So I don't stand before you today to say, forget all that stuff. It's all bull. I stand before you today to say, make those federal land management agencies within the Department of Interior do the same thing you're asking other stakeholders and say what they're going to do to fix it to avoid a listing instead of afterwards. Because when you talk millions of acres where it's controlled by the federal government, I think they ought to play the same as everybody else. So that's why to give them a year to come before. And by the way, not a political agenda. This is the Appropriations Committee. They have asked you for very little. And by the way, folks, it's 11 Western states. So to talk about 35 million bucks spread across 11 western states, with all due respect, is not a, huge, not a huge investment in terms of what we're trying to do to do the right thing by the ecosystem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion? Mr. Simpson. Mr. Chairman, I... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was hoping... Uh, since this is the last amendment, that Mr. Moran, uh, my good friend from Virginia, would present an amendment that I could support, because this will be his last amendment that he, <laughs> that he uh, proposes in this uh, full committee. But I can't support this one. What I don't think most people recognize, and Mr. Moran said it in his statement, the problem is we're not trying, we're not trying to say don't ever list the sage grouse, and I know there are some people who have proposed a bill that says it can't be listed for 10 years. I'm not a sponsor of that, not a co-sponsor of that. What we're trying to say is give us the time to do the work that's necessary. If you talk to the BLM out on the ground, you talk to the stakeholders out on the ground that are all working on this, and I will tell you the four states I know the most about, uh, uh, the sage-grouse, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, uh, Nevada, and uh, Oregon, those states have been working diligently, diligently with the BLM and Fish and Wildlife Service to develop a management plan to preserve 
the habitat. You know what the biggest threat to sage grouse habitat or sage chicken habit or chicken habitat or sage hen habitat all the same? You know what the biggest threat to it is? Wildfire. Destroys more habitat than anything else. You know what one of the things is that helps prevent those rangeland fires from spreading? Grazing. So there's some conflicts that go on here. And they are working hard, the states and the federal government, together to develop state management plans that the state and the federal government can both accept. We just need the time to do it. As the gentleman from Nevada said, this is the biggest listing, potential listing, in the country. And the impacts are dramatic. So I would encourage my colleagues to reject this amendment, support the underlying bill, <coughs> and make sure we have the time to do what's right, both by the landowners, by the, by the uh, states, and by the stage in. So I appreciate the gentleman's efforts, but I hope that we will reject his amendment. Is there further discussion? Any use? Hearing none, the gentleman's recognized to close. All right. Uh, well, I understand that you can't support this, uh, Mr. Simpson, although I, I do think you should. Uh, they, uh, uh, in response to Mr. Amaday, um, you know, the, the federal government may own uh, a, a, a lot of those states in the West, uh, but the reality is that half of the revenue generated does come into the state, uh, 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 to the state government, and the governors would be hard-pressed to operate the federal services that are now operated, which generate that revenue without uh, much of any effort on the part of the states. Now, with regard to the sage grouse, it's at 10 percent of its historic population. We don't want the sage grouse listed. We want to make sure that it isn't listed. That's why we need to move forward on this. Because if you don't address it, if you don't move in the process of the Fish and Wildlife Service is moving, then it is going to become extinct and it is going to be listed as an endangered species. We don't want it to. But we brought all those parties to the table because of the settlement agreement. They're at the table now and because they have to come to a decision by September of next year. If you have this rider pass, then there's no deadline. They all pull back out. And, and, and nothing of consequence is going to be done except that the sage grouse is going to be, become extinct. And then it's, it does become an endangered species. And then you can't protect those large swaths of, uh, of land in the West that we all want to be able uh, to, uh, 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 to be uh, free from ESA listing. Because that's going to be a very expensive, very difficult uh, challenge. So, you know, the long-term objective is the same. Let's not list it. But you've got to do something in order to mitigate the, the situation as it exists today. That's why I'd ask for support for the amendment, Mr. Chairman. Question is on the Moran Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Hearing none, Chairman Wolf is recognized for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2015 to the House. You've heard the uh, motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. The motion is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, we're going to have to ask for a roll call. Do you have to? Yeah. Roll call is requested. Roll call is requested. All in favor, raise your right hand. A sufficient number. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderhold, Mr. Adderhold, aye. Mr. Amaday, Mr. Amaday, aye. Mr. Bishop, Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert, Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Crenshaw, Mr. Crenshaw, aye. Mr. Coyar, Mr. Coyar, aye. Mr. Culberson, Mr. Culberson, aye. Ms. Deloro, Ms. Deloro, no. Mr. Dent, Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. Diaz Villard, Mr. Diaz Villard, aye. Mr. Farr. Mr. Farr, no. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fleischman? Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Mr. Freelingheisen? Aye. Mr. Freelingheisen, aye. Ms. Granger? Aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves? Aye. Mr. Graves, aye. Mr. Dr. Harris? Aye. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler? Aye. Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mr. Honda? Aye. Mr. Honda, no. Mr. Joyce? Mr. Joyce? 
Ms. Kaptur. Ms. Kaptur, no. Mr. Kingston. Mr. Latham. Mr. Latham, I'm Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy. No. Mrs. Lowy, no. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, no. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Nunnally. Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens, no. Mr. Pastor. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, no. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Yes. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Robo Allard. Ms. Robo Allard, no. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, no. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, aye. Mr. Visklowski. Mr. Visklowski, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, aye. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, aye. Are there members who wish to be recorded? Mr. Joyce. Mr. Fatah. Mr. Fatah, no. Do Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce. Now, I want to know something. Mr. Joyce, aye. Are there members who wish to be recorded or change their vote? Hearing none, the clerk will tally. On this motion, the yeas are 29, the nays are 19. The motion is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be given the authority to make technical and conforming changes to the items approved today. Without objection, so ordered. Three days are granted. If there's no further business, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>